And a pleasant good evening to everyone out there in Irish Breakdown land. I am Vince D'Addario. I am the football analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. And with me as always is that guy. That's Brian Driscoll. He is the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. And we are going to jump right back into our position previews and a position that both Brian and I have very much been looking forward to discussing going into spring. And that is, of course, the offensive line, Brian. Mm -hmm. This is... We have been maligned when it comes to the offensive line for quite some time. And in our wildest dreams, we all hoped and prayed that Harry Heastan would come back to coach these guys up. And that actually occurred. That actually happened. Our dreams came true. Hoped and prayed, but said many times, <laughs> it ain't never going to happen. <laughs> That's right. And so now we get to see what that looks like and we are a mere days away from the first spring practice where we get to get an inkling of what this group might look like moving forward yeah it, it's it's really interesting Vince as you kind of look at this position group and just think about how much has changed you know we went into last season saying look I'm concerned about it but I'm going to give coach Quinn the benefit of the doubt it was the first time in his tenure that he was going to coach an offensive line that was filled up with primarily his guys. And that was important for us to discuss because the foundation that Harry Heastan laid was gone, basically. Right. And and so the players, all talented as they were, what kind of foundation were they going to have? You know, was this a group that was really going to have the the mentality, the you know, carry on the legacy of what had come before? And as we found out, they weren't ready to do that. And the thing that you and I stuck with was we didn't believe it was a talent issue of the guys in the roster, maybe of some of the guys that they played, but not necessarily the overall you know, talent of the roster. And just it, it held the offense back. I, mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at, you know, I wrote a series of articles last week about the pass game and why I'm really optimistic about the pass game. And so much of the data and the film, as I study the film again, and I go mm -hmm. through the beginning of the year, it's like, I was breaking down the Wisconsin and Cincinnati games. And Vince, I'm telling you, there was probably eight to 10 throws that were just dudes coming open that if Jack Cohn would have had time or, or Drew Pine when he went in the game, if they just would have had time to go to their number two read, yeah, it's a big play. I Not mean, even it's the a third or big fourth. Play. Yeah. Yes. And like there was a play where he threw a quick, Jack Cohn threw a quick pass to Michael Mayer to his left. And Mayer was kind of covered. It ended up being a complete pass. In an ideal world, you know, that's I, I'm going to go back to this look because I see this linebacker flying out to take him. I know I got a backside kind of, you know, backside seam route or, you know, kind of like a drag, but a little bit more of a vertical. I don't even know what to call that route. But Avery Davis was coming open. If Jack Cohn could have looked away from Mayer and come back to Avery Davis, he hits them and he's got room to run. This is the first drive of the game. And, of course, you know, Mayer, he has to get rid of the ball because as soon as he threw the ball to Mayer on a – on a quick five yard option run, he got hit. Right. You know, and it's just, it was that over and over and over again. Well, then the line finally starts giving more time as the schedule got weaker and they played some really not good passing teams or pass rush teams. And lo and behold, the pass offense just shreds. Right. And it was just one of those things where, as I compared the data to Alabama and Ohio State and teams like that, like, Notre Dame's clean pocket numbers were every bit as good as Alabama's from a Perth. They were like 9.0 yards per attempt. Bama was at like 9.3. Notre Dame was at 12 and a half yards per completion. Bama was at 12.4. They were both over 70% completions. It's like when Jack Cohn had a clean pocket last year, it was really good. It just didn't have as many clean pockets as other quarterbacks. And it's just one of those things where we knew the line was going to determine what the direction of the offense and how good the offense could be. We both felt they had a lot of really good skill talent. Still feel that way. It just was, can the line allow them to play? And it didn't. Right. And and that was the issue. And, you know, that needs to change. And there's a lot. I mean, look, we we assume that Harry Heastan is going to do a better job. I think he is. The question for me is, is okay, how much better? Are we going to get the Harry Heastan of old? Are we going to get a new and improved version of Harry Heastan, which we'll talk about? Are we going to get a not – you know, not quite there. I mean, but it's no matter what it is, it's going to be better. Yes, I mean, exactly. That's the thing. It's going to yes. be better. Yes. And some of the young talent is now going to be a year older. You know, Andrew Kristoffic has experience under his belt now as a student starting lineup, which he didn't have last year. Joel, Joel Walton, Blake Fisher now have yep. a year under their belt. Right. So there's there's that. 
so there's just a lot of optimism. But the big thing for me, Vince, this this offseason has been I've been shocked at the buzz about the offensive line from everybody else in the program. And I was talking, so just so you know, if you're if you're a member of the message board and you haven't been on this morning, I did put a defensive intel fe- feature up. We had the offensive intel feature last week, just kind of what I'm hearing from all my sources around the program about guys on offense. Today was the one about you know about the defense. And you know, I talked to a few different sources, and, and the one I talked to today, it, it's like we're talking about the defensive line. And every time he he would make a comment about a player, it would be like, but we're going to find out this spring. I'm like, kind of like, well, what do you mean? And it's like, well, we're going to be going up against a much better unit now. Like, that's what he was like. The expectation is like the defensive line feels that they're going to be better now because of the offensive line. Right. right. The receivers feel, the running backs feel like everybody feels like because Harry, he stands back, we're going to be better because I think people believe in the talent, right? Yes. It's that they weren't being prepared. And that was something that kind of surprised me. I wasn't surprised that when I talked to my sources on the offensive side that they're like, yeah, the line's going to be better. I was really surprised that the defensive coaches seemed to be like, wow, like this is going to make us better. That's the well, expectation for Harry Heastan coming in. Yeah, and, and I think last year there was a bit of false confidence watching the defense just absolutely shred the offensive line in the spring and in the fall, right? I mean – there, there, it gets to a point where you're having so much success defensively where you're like, well, yeah, we're really good. You know, we can do this on a regular basis and, you know, and all that. And I'm not saying the defensive line and the defensive front wasn't good for Notre Dame, mm-hmm. but they were so good against this offensive line that it was almost like a false, you know, well, confidence situation. But, you know, to your point, Vince, I think you, I think you hit on something because the defensive line ended up being really good last year. Yeah. It took them a couple games to get, 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 because to your point, I think that they were so dominant against the offensive line. Right. That, like you said, they weren't pushed the way that they should have been pushed. And then they get to Florida State and Toledo, and like these are better coached and all those different things, and they just weren't as good. And it took them a while to kind of get into the, right. the, the groove. Once they got into the groove, they were really good. And even in the two first two games, the D line still made some big plays. I mean, Isaiah Foskey had a big couple big sacks, and Jason Adamiola had a couple big plays. And it just it took them a while as a unit to really say, okay, this is the level of intensity that we're going to be facing on Saturdays. And they never really got that during the season and you know during the preparation and things like that. And and then right. also where the youth hurt Notre Dame. So Brian Kelly used youth as an excuse a lot, and then we rejected a lot. But one of the areas where I do think youth was a valid criticism is once you get into games, the scout team was basically made up of freshmen and walk-ons. And that, now that was, it was where, you know, because you're not – those guys are just naturally not going to be as big or as strong as a junior or something like that, talking about the freshmen. Right. And so I think that is another aspect of it is is like it, it's like the, the competition was getting up on Saturdays compared to where it should have been. Well, just that alone this year, you're going to be going against freshmen, a lot of freshmen again. But, you know, perhaps you're going to see Pat Coogan again. Well, he's now got a year under his belt in the weight room. You're going to see maybe Caleb Johnson again. He's now got a year under his belt in the weight room. And then the incoming freshman class at that level is going to be even better than last year's in regards to the guys that are potentially going to be down on scout team. Because let's be honest, the two best freshmen in last year's class or the three best freshmen in last year's class were never on scout team. Rocco right. wasn't on scout team, I don't believe. And then obviously Blake Fisher and Joe Walt weren't on scout team. Joe Walt might have been like at the very beginning of the year, but he was quickly moved up because of the injury to Blake Fisher in the opener. So right, right. just all around, I think the offensive line is gonna is gonna be better. The question, Vince, is how much better. I think that's right. the question that we're gonna start to see little glimpses of in the spring. We're not gonna have the full answer by and the I, spring. And I think that's really important to to mention. Like you're not gonna see a finished product on Thursday. You know what I mean? Number I mean, one, they're not gonna even be in pads. Right. You know, right. so I mean it's it's a process, but even by the end of spring. We're going to see steps in the right direction, but if if anybody's expecting to see the hair, you know, uh, a Joe Moore Award winning offensive line at the end of spring, I mean that's just not realistic. I don't think you're going to see that from 130 teams. I mean, that's what right. yeah, absolutely. However, yes, however, however, we we should see immediately, like within the first padded practice, we should start to see differences. 
because you're talking speed. about so, firing right. off the ball and stuff like that. Yeah, techniques absolutely. better. The, yes, the, the, they're 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 winning more battles. They're you know they're right. they're doing some good things. They're pushing the defense. They're right. m- getting big runs. They're giving the quarterback time. The technique is better. Like those are the things that we're going to look at. And we, you know, you'll be at the practices. Uh, one of your former offensive line coaches is going to be at the practices, so he's going to yeah. be really oh, fired up to watch stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's fired up about it. And so, you know, we're going to obviously have a lot to see and say about that, you know, and, and so that's clearly going to be one of the areas that we're going to look at. And, you know, so it, it, it's it's exciting time, Vince, because I really feel like this is a period where I feel like with everything that we have said since we launched this channel, the next 12 months – Really, the next well, we not, nine months, right? Nine to ten months is going to go a long way to say, okay, were we right? You know, right? Um, were, were we yeah. right about that? And, yeah. and 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 to me, you know, that's why you know when I when I'm when as I'm sitting there explaining kind of like the latest buzz that I'm hearing about, you know, the people being excited about Harry Heastan and what he's bringing yeah. back and all these other kind right. of things. It's like, you know. It, we're going to find out because the feeling in the program, and this is the, this is the thing that excites me is, you know, talking to sources, there's not the attempt to tamp everything down. Now it's like the people that I talk to actually, it's funny is the people I talk to on defense are more tamping things down than people on offense, just because that's kind of their nature. And that's how a lot of them are and just have always been, but normally it's the other, it's the other way around. It's like, listen, we're, you know, Hey, we're talented and it's it, it. And the reason that's important is not to create like false hype or whatever, but it's like, if you don't believe you're great, then you're not going to be great. You, you know what I mean? Like if you think, Hey, we should be great. Then that's the standard I'm going to hold you to. Then that, then that's going to raise the bar. And, and that's really the feeling I got from talking to just different yeah. sources on offense is They feel like that foundation is going to be so much better now along the offensive line that we're going to get our chance to shine out here. And I think that's a lot of the excitement when, when it comes down to, to why this team is, there's a lot of energy and buzz about the offensive line and the offenses generals, because we're going to find out if you and I are correct about the talent level being better than maybe people thought it was. We've been saying that a lot and and the talent level is better than we think. Well, Hey, there's no more excuses, right? There's no. No, we can't blame Brian Kelly for, you know, the offense not being, you know, good again. Now, again, it, you're not going to, you know, reinvent the wheel or just completely change out everything and score 60 points a game next year. But again, we should see improvements, right? Yes. I mean, if, if, if the receivers aren't playing with better technique or aren't making more plays, then I can't blame Dell Alexander anymore. You know, if the offensive line's getting its butt kicked every, every day in practice, I can't blame Jeff Quinn anymore. Right. And, and so that's the thing is we're now going to find out, was it a player problem or was it a coaching problem all along? And that's kind of what I'm excited about this spring. Yes, I'm confident absolutely. in my conviction that it was yes. not a player problem. Well, right? because we've but seen we're going to find we've out. seen evidence in the past. We've seen empirical evidence from one coaching staff or one position coach to the next. Mm-hmm. We've seen it. And then we've seen the the uh, influence of the former coach during the the other coach, right? So we, we've seen it, right? So I'm very confident in our assessment moving forward as well, but the rubber meets the road coming up. Right. I mean, it, it's just, it is it. what it is. Yeah, exactly. So we need to see it. Now we got to see it. So Vince, let's talk about what we know yeah. and what we don't know. <laughs> right, right. Obviously what we know, let's begin with, we know that Joe Walt and Blake Fisher are going to be offensive tackles, and we know <laughs> that this line is going to be better. Right, yeah. because of the presence of Harry He stands. So let's let's begin talking about that. I think there's a lot of attention that we could kind of go into about oh, is Blake Fisher gonna be left tackle, right tackle? I think you and I can agree that it doesn't matter. I don't care. I have my preference, you have your preference, but I don't really care. I mean, if if Harry He stands says, Hey, I want Blake Fisher at right, or if I want Blake Fisher at left, I want Joe Wall at right, Joe, yeah, I'd probably I probably would have done different, but you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. What we do know, however, is those two guys are poised to really have breakouts because Notre Dame was expected to have a freshman All-American last year. We all thought they were going to have one. Yeah. I'm just not the one that it was. Yeah, not the one that it was. That's right. Thing. And so that's the excitement is like the guy that we are we all think is going to be a great player. I mean, Ryan Harris is on this channel talking about how this is one of the you know incredibly talented players. I'm talking to you know former Notre Dame offensive linemen here in the NFL who were great college players and part of some great offensive lines saying that might be the most talented kid I've ever seen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, 
that's that those are people that played with Quentin Nelson. Like he yeah. you know, compare they're talking about comparing him to to Quentin, you know, and it's like mm, he's just an athlete and something. a giant body. Right. Like you know what I mean? Like he's just so right. athletic. And he's and the thing that I think I think that surprised a lot of people was uh, two things surprised a lot of people about Blake is number one, his mental aptitude, and the surprise is you just a lot of freshmen are just it's it's a huge jump from high playing offensive line in high school to, to college. I mean, it's just there's just so much more. Most that's why Quentin Nelson redshirted, Mike McGlinchey redshirted, Ronnie Stanley redshirted, right. Zach Martin redshirted, right? The, the Notre Dame just, greats recently. Right. Greats, I mean, all other than Hainsey and Elmer, like you know, none of those guys really played as freshmen. I mean, Liam Eikenberg sat the bench for two years. So the, the mental aptitude, it's just the offensive line is just a huge adjustment, in my opinion, from from high school to football and how quickly Blake picked it up just showed like this kid sure. has a mind for the game. And that's, you don't always know that about any top recruit until you see him do it. And then the other thing was he works. I mean, that's the thing that's really surprised, but he works and he's not one of those kids that just relies on being bigger and stronger and more athletic. He says, you know, he works to, I want to be the best version of myself. And, and I think that's important too. All right. So we, ex that's why I expect Blake to be, to be great. And, from what we've heard so far, the connection between him and Coach Eastan so far has been really good. Awesome. And that's one of the big questions that we had. And then, obviously, Joe Walt is Joe Walt. And so there's excitement there. He's just going to be steady Eddie, man. <laughs> right. Now, can they take it? You know, what kind of leap they can take? We know that Coach Eastan is going to be Coach Eastan. So there's certainly some things, Vince, that we feel like we know who the tackles are going to be. We know what he stand brings to the table, and and I, I think we can confidently say the line's going to be better. But I think we would have said that even if Jeff Quinn was back, because there is so much coming Just, back. Absolutely. The question, you know, is still about how much better. I think is really where the conversation needs to be. That that's yeah. where I'm coming from. No, 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 and I I agree with you. I think I think Joe Alt, you could stick him at any position and he's going to be just fine because he's just going to put his head down and quietly work and just get better and bigger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And because that's what he did. No one expected anything of Joe Alt going into the right. fall of last year. Right. I mean, nobody. And I remember that first practice, you know, you're like, Hey man, get a picture of Joe Alt. I need to I get a video of him like moving around. I'm like, he's a lot bigger than we thought he was going to be. Yeah. But and that's why I wanted you to get a picture. Somebody had yeah. told me Somebody's like, hey, this kid's way bigger than we thought he was going to be. Like, because they right. were thinking he was going to show up like 275, 280, and he showed up over 300 pounds. Yeah. But it was and like, good I, and I got and the reason pounds. I wanted you to take the video was I got a little bit nervous. Right. I'm like, that's a lot of weight for that kid. I'm not sure if I'm ready to, if I, I don't know if his body's ready for that. Like, so what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to take a video of him going through stretch. Right. I wanted to see him bending and, you know, and all those type of things since I couldn't be at practice. And I was surprised at how well he moved. Like that was the big thing for me. Like, oh wow, this kid hasn't lost any yet. This kid went from being in like a 240 pound junior to a 300 plus pound freshman in college, yeah. and didn't lose a, an ounce of athleticism. And he was a tight that, end. I mean, he wasn't even yeah, a lineman. Exactly. It's like, That's yeah. what surprised me. I was like, wow, okay, this is uh, this kid's got a little something, right? But yeah. even then, it's like, well, but you know, like, he's not be ready as a freshman, right? Like, because you have that preconceived idea of what you thought he was going to be coming out of high school. And I loved his upside. I gave him a four and yeah. star upside grade. Absolutely. He's going to need time to get there. So, you know, that's the thing is you've got the freak talent at one side. You've got right. just that long, steady, well-coached kind of guy uh, on the other side. And you just feel like even though they're both true – I've I've never gone into a season where I looked at a team that had two true sophomores at offensive tackle and was like, yeah, they're good. Yeah, they're I know, soft, right? fine there. <laughs> you know, they're fine. Right. I mean <laughs> – that, but and perhaps we're in error with that assumption. Perhaps, perhaps we're assuming too much of them that they're going to have some growing pains. But it's just what we've seen. I mean, they went up against one of the best pass rushes in college football in the bowl game last year and held their own for 60, 70 plus snaps of pass because they threw 68 passes, but they had over 70 pass snaps because there was a couple sacks and there was you know, some scrambles and stuff like that. But they they held up against the, the one of the four or five best pass rushes in all. I mean, they were number one in the nation in sacks last year coming into that bowl game. Texas, Oklahoma State was. Right. And they got had a couple sacks, but like the sack Joe Walt gave up, that was a covered sack, in my opinion. And that's where I think a lot of my optimism comes from. It's like the fact that they went against that group. You know, for a half, Blake Fisher went against Jermaine Johnson on several snaps and held his own. Jermaine Johnson yeah. is going to be a day two pick this year from Florida State. And it's like, yeah, hey, look, now those guys are getting coached by the best. 
boy, there's just there's excitement. And, and perhaps we're putting too much on them this early. I think we need to be mindful of that. And when they do maybe make some mistakes in the spring, like, hey, Blake's just a sophomore with two games under his belt. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah. th- but that's the kind of excitement we All have right. about him is we got to remind, and hey, look, he's right. still a pup. He's still a pup. Yes. Right. Absolutely. But the potential's there and the talent is there for these these two guys to be to for Notre Dame. Because look, that's what that's what's been the, the the anchor of the Notre Dame Lions, right? Like, yeah, there's been great interior players. Obviously, Chris Watt was a really good player, and Quentin Nelson was a, a generational player, and they've had you know Sam Mustafer, Alex Bars. I mean, there's been good interior players, but the 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 foundation of the great lines that Notre Dame has had in recent years is every single one had great tackle play. Right. And in today's game, I don't care how good you are up in the middle. If you don't have great tackle play, you're going to struggle because there's real and, good edge players and, out there right. that are going to make plays. Right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Right. No and so that's not. what we know. We know those are the three things that I think we can confidently say we know, because one of the things we thought we knew going into the spring, we don't know anymore because Jared Patterson's hurt. Right. And that was going to be the other thing. Like, well, you know, Jared Patterson's going to do this, this and this. So. I definitely feel like there's a strong foundation for this line to build upon heading into Absolutely. Spring. Yeah, no no question. And at, th- those are the knowns. Those are the ones that we know for sure. We know Patterson's going to be there. He's going to be in the middle, and he's going to knock it down, but not in the spring. And so what does that look like, uh, you know, moving forward? I think that would go under the what we don't know for the most part mm-hmm. category. We know that there's going to be a battle at both guard positions, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and so that, so what we know is there's going to be a battle. What we don't know is what the outcome of that battle is going to be. Right. And I, and I right. think that I would be surprised, I think, if that battle waged on too far into fall, um, maybe a little bit, but I think a lot of it is going to be kind of figured out here moving forward. Yeah, I'm not as confident in you as, in that one, Vince. I'm not quite as as sold that it's going to get figured out that quickly. I okay. And the reason I say that is is because, you know, I think that that if the, if they determine it too early, then I feel like it's going to be because they're they're just going to hand it to the veterans, right? And and that's why I, think I don't that, want that at all. Yeah. Yeah, because like, look, it's not like Rocco Spindler's not going to beat Josh Lugout by the end of spring. Is my point. He's not okay. going to beat out Andrew Kostovic by the end of spring. Is my point. Um, not that he may never beat them out. I'm, I'm, I'm just making the point like those guys are going to need time to let them develop and let them battle. And, and honestly, if Josh Lug gets off to a bad start this spring, it shouldn't be one of those things like, well, send him on the bench because he, again, he's moving to a new position that he hasn't played in a couple of years. So I don't think that we're going to see that. Plus I think that they want to keep that healthy competition. They want to keep the young guys invested. Keep moving like, look, forward. Yeah. Rocco, right now you in the spring is the number two. But look, man, you, you you right at the beginning of the spring, they were here and you were here. Right. Now they're here and you're here. You keep yeah. working, you know, and you, you don't want to you don't want to cut it, it, same thing a quarterback, right? Like if 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 Tyler Buckner is clearly the better quarterback by the end of spring, I, I wouldn't be- necessarily say, okay, you're the guy. Yeah. I'm still giving Drew Pine. I think Drew's earned that right to, to do that. And then vice versa, if Drew Pine's clearly the better quarterback, right? Same thing offensive line, because I want those guys to remain help those those guys to remain kind of in that competitive mindset when it comes to the offensive line. Now, if it's just so like obvious, and then, then we'll know that, but I think that would be concerning for me. Because I don't think it's like where Josh Lug is going to become the next Quentin Nelson, right? Like that would no, be the only I, way where I wouldn't be concerned about there being a big gap. If there's a big gap to where it's done by the end of spring, you know, I, it um, it would be a little bit concerning for me. And so I want to see a battle. You know, I want to see I want to see what kind of what, what's Andrew Kostafa going to do this spring, right? Like, is he going to make growth as a player? Or is he uh, going to be? He, or is he going to be like, "Hey, I'm the starter," and just kind of coast? Which, if you know Andrew, I'm not, I don't I'm not think that's. That. But that's the question yeah. you have to learn, right? right. And, and, and I'm not and, saying that about him specifically. Yeah. I'm saying in general, when you're a returning right. starter, there are guys that just kind of put it in coast mode. More so for me, it's more of a okay. Is that the best we can get from Andrew Gustav, or does he have another level that Harry Heaton sure. can get him to? Right. You know, that's kind of the question for me. And is it enough to still hang on to the starting job? I think. I think that's a fair question. You know, how is the combination of Matt Bayless and Harry Heastan going to really influence guys like Andrew Kristoffic more than anybody else, right? Like yeah. he's one of those guys where it's like, that kid should be playing with more power than you'd think he would. Well, now he's going into a senior year. He's got to have multiple years in the weight room. I think now those young guys, because I think his class was really hurt by the COVID year because they missed like 
four good months right. as rising sophomores of weight room time that's really integral to their development. All right, they were doing because it all by home. March. It was over, and then they right. couldn't come back to like July. Right, they were off campus and they couldn't come back. And so you, you had some really unfortunate situations. So I think those guys are all a little bit behind the eight ball in regards to where a, a, a junior should have been last season. Is that, am I accurate in that concern? If so, then we should see a big jump from a guy like Andrew Kristoffic, you know, from a strength right. standpoint. Yes. Uh, we should see a jump from Zeke Carell from that standpoint. So that's another thing that I'm looking for this spring is do we see that kind of jump from those guys? Is it enough, uh, you know, to, to, to say, hey, look, he was a good, steady player last year, but can he be a four? See, that's the question with Andrew Kristoffic is if he hangs on to the job, is he just going to be a steady? Because, like, he was – last year He when he came in, he wasn't like um, – he wasn't like a dominant player. What he was happening was he wasn't getting his mistakes. butt kicked. Yeah, exactly. Right? He, he right. didn't make a ton of mistakes. Right. He wasn't getting his butt kicked. He was just kind of doing his job, right? And, and But he wasn't, like, dominating. The question right. I have is, is that just who Andrew Kristoffic is? He's just kind of a – just, and that's okay. I mean, if you're surrounded by a, a great center right. and a really good left tackle, and Which you know, then be. you could kind of say, like, Kristoffic and Alt are very similar. You know, Alt wasn't a dominant player last year, physically dominant, as you don't expect a, a, a true freshman, freshman, freshman to be that way. Yeah, right. Maybe a true freshman like Blake Fisher, who's 330, that can throw some weight around. But, like, Joe Alt, you don't expect him to be physically dominant as a freshman. He just did his job. And so the left side of the line was just steady. And for the first time all year, when those two finally got together, I think it was Virginia Tech was the first time they were together. You just kind of started to see over the next couple games, Jack Cohn just started getting more and more comfortable in the pocket because he didn't he didn't feel like he had to look over his shoulder. I mean, literally look over his shoulder the whole time because the left tackle was just a a, a sieve for once Blake Fisher went down for the next five games. it It was just a hot mess. Horrible. Well, Andrew and Joe Alt sort of solidified it, just made it steady. Yes. Okay. Steady's fine. And, and, but if I want more than that, I want Absolutely. it. Andrew's a guy that I think can bring, needs to bring more in the, in the run game, you know, and, and that's where I'm curious to see how the jump is for him because he's going to be coached better, right? He's going to be coached to play with more force. Got another year in the weight room. Are we going to see him? kind of take that jump that's a question i don't know if we're going to see that jump this year right i want to see if he's going to make that jump no i completely yeah i completely agree and i and i think that i think andrew can make that jump but that's the difference between a good offensive line and a great offensive line is can these guys take that next step from just being assignment correct because i think that was really that's what he and Alt brought to the table when they both got in there. They were, at the very least, they were assignment correct. They got their head on who they needed to get their head on, and they just didn't get beat, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the bar wasn't terribly high when they when they both first got in there. Now, I think we started to raise the bar for them as they continued to move on, but now that bar has to be raised even more now that they're going to have an offseason and, and all of that in the weight room, et cetera. So, that's going to be the difference. So if if Andrew is going to maintain that left guard spot, if he's going to win that battle, is it going to be just because he was just kind of the most steady, or is he going to take that step and be dominant? Right, right. and that's and that's going to be huge. Right, and and to me, same thing with Josh Luggett guard. You know, is is he just too many injuries, and he's just never going to be that guy that we thought he could be because he was a mover in the run game as a high school player in Pittsburgh yeah. and. He, he did a decent job of that as a tackle in 2019. He wasn't a mover last year. At times, you'd see the flashes of it. But, you know, was that a technique thing? Was that an injury thing? Was that, you know, was that he just wasn't sure what he was doing because the coaching wasn't what it needed to be? Those are unknowns. Does moving to guard and allowing him to play in tighter quarters allow him to be more aggressive and play more physical? Does Harry Heastan's coaching kind of get more out of him? Josh, is a t- in many ways, is a big unknown. And he's a guy he that is. I think a lot of fans are just assuming – I don't want him starting. I don't want him. I don't, you know, he, he needs to get beat out. And I understand that. And, and, and I'm sympathetic to that based on kind of what we saw, but, but I would discourage people from having that opinion because we felt last year that he was out of position 
And and we also felt last year he just wasn't coached to play his game. He was he was doing things that. in pass pro where yeah. he's like doing these vertical sets where he's like on his heels. It's like that's terrible coaching. That right. was worse than what he was in 2019 when he was still closer to the the Harry Heastan era where he was still playing with Robert Hainsey and Liam Eikenberg and those guys who were kind of working with those guys. I mean, that's the things we heard is you know, Vince, you and I heard both heard it that the veterans would kind of do some yeah. of the critiquing of their teammates. It shouldn't be that way, but it, oh. it was. And so I want to see what Josh looks like if healthy under Harry Heastan. Right. Now, I don't know how much Josh is going to play this spring because he's coming off the knee surgery that, that kept him out of the spring. Right. Shouldn't have been that bad. It was a meniscus. It wasn't like a torn ACL. So I would assume he's going to be out there. But for how much? I don't know. But I want to see what he can do. Is he going to be able to be a big mover? Because he's, I mean, he's 6'7", 310 pounds. I mean, he the should guard, be able to move. I mean, that's what I want from a guard. Like, I, right. I want I want a grader. I want a road grader at guard. I want a guy that's going to be able to move some big meat out of the way, right? And and you also have to be able to get to the second level when you're a guard a lot more than you did when you're a tackle. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that that is going to be really important for Josh because you and I have discussed on multiple occasions how we think guard is his better position than tackle, right? And it's because of what happens when he's in space trying to pass protect. Mm-hmm. My only worry about Josh moving forward, just because I haven't seen it enough recently, is his movement getting to the next level. I think he can do it. Right. I, I And again, I agree. I think I think guard is his spot. I think he is a mover. I think, I think he's better in a smaller window than he is on the outside mm-hmm. where he yeah. has to really get ground and all of that and he has to give yeah giving some guys just aren't meant to give ground they're just it doesn't have they don't have the mentality for it and i think think josh is one of those guys yes absolutely and so coming off a double team i think he'll do well i i I think guard is his spot but again Mm -hmm. what's that knee going to be like in the spring what's that competition going to be like is somebody going to push josh lug right And and i think that's really important I think that's he, really it important. needs to happen. And even if Josh gets the starting job, that's not what I care about. But I don't, it, if Josh is just the clear cut right guard, either he is way better than we think, or guys aren't developing, or there's been an injury, and yeah. none of those are positives. Well, the first one's a big time positive, the next two are not positive, you know? <laughs> right? Um, and, and the other thing, too, is, is, is we have to understand is if, if let's say Rocco Spindler's a right guard and he's battling Josh Lug, he's battling Andrew Kristoffic as well. Yes. I mean, that's the thing is, like, if, if Rocco's the second best guard, they're not going to leave him behind Josh Luggett, right guard. They're going to move him and let him battle left guard. That's the other thing that we have to remember, too. But, you know, it's important that those guys make the jump, Vince, because what what I – my only concern about the offensive line is this. Like, the, the athleticism of the group is really good, I believe. And, and, and – but – Jeff Quinn didn't recruit a lot of maulers, a lot right. of real physical guys. We think Rocco can be that guy. We think Lug can be that guy. But is Lug going to still – I mean, he he thought he could have been that guy before all the injuries. Can he be that guy now? We don't know. You know, I thought Kristoffic was going to be a really good run defense, run blocker, but he just hasn't shown that he's going to be that mover, right? Again, steady Eddie guy. And so, to me, that's my big concern is if the guards can't come out and move, then this is going to end up being a finesse offense. It's going to have to be a finesse run game. Right, because it's going to have to be like outside zones and buck sweeps. Where because what you're going to have to do is if you can't come off in zones, and Vince and I are you know combo block, and we're working together, and we're pushing guys off the line, getting to that second level. Right, if we're not creating movement, then it's hard to run the inside zone. It's hard to run counters. What you have to counter was you have to start. You have to have r- designed runs that work laterally, that play to our strengths, and and uh, you know and limit the vertical push. So it becomes you know, like a fast swipe, kind of a lateral block. And the other thing you got to do is you cre- you got to create more pin and pull situations, you know, where you down block and try to kick out. Well, the problem with that is that once you declare that, it kind of start guys start hitting their gaps. Once he down blocks and I see that, I'm I'm declaring I'm going here, right? And so it just – if if you have to go to that because you can't run your inside zone, you can't run your counters because you're not getting movement. And when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about against Ohio State and – you know, right. BYU and Clemson and, you know, the, the post postseason teams, I don't, you can run on a lot of the teams in the schedule, but you're not evaluating Notre Dame anymore on beating Marshall and Cal and no, Navy maybe. and Syracuse right. and, a, you know, and Stanford. And it's now, okay, are you able to do this in the big games? 
And that's the key. And so if you can't get movement up front, it makes your inside zones less effective against the best teams on the schedule. And then that also puts more of a burden on Tyler Buckner as a runner if you can't get movement. So it's really important. That's one of the things I'm going to be looking for this spring because they are facing an undersized defensive line. You're not going to see Jason Adamiol out there, right? He's not going to practice this spring. The interior of the line should be kind of good, right? When you consider they're going against Howard Cross and Jacob Lacey, who are good players, but undersized players, they shouldn't be getting their butts kicked and get blown off the ball by those right. guys. Right Now, can they handle those guys' athleticism? That's a different conversation, but we're talking about from a power standpoint. Right. And so those are things I'm looking at with that. And then the second question, obviously, is can a guy like Rocco Spindler push one of those guys? And then that, that to me, is a big question mark, Vince, is – Rocco looked good last spring. Yeah. Did he a lot lose of reps. confidence? Did he get hurt? Like what what caused them to say this guy's ending the spring with the first team to where this guy's only played two games? Two it games. Was a minimal amount of snaps in those two games. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was absolutely right. But he only yeah. played he didn't get the full four right. you get the full the four red shirt. Red shirt. Yeah. yeah. So I played him two, which yeah. you know, again, it reminds me of times in the past where it's like they don't want to put a guy out there and he may play really well. Remember when they did that to Phil, when Phil came out early in 2019 and every time he played, man, he was smoking. And then after the Michigan game, they hardly ever put him out there when they did. It was just handoff, 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 right. basically, because I feel like they didn't want to didn't show, want to show up what he could do. Right. Yeah. And same exactly. thing with, you know, Kane Madden last year and Rocco Spindler. If you put Kane, if you put Rocco in there and he starts blowing dudes off the ball, it's like, how do you then justify keeping, keeping Kane, Kane Madden, Madden Exactly. And I, that was, I don't yeah. feel like. Rocco would have had to be an all world uh, guard to mm -hmm. do that. And I, and yeah. I, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because now that I look back on it, that's a really, really good point because they obviously had their mind up made up. They, they were going to play right. Kane and that's fine. But then you can't defend that if you put somebody else in and he gets outplayed and there, you cannot defend that because there's just too many eyes on the, on what's happening. You can't defend it. So how do we solve that? Uh, we just don't put them in at all, you know, and then that's how you solve that problem. And that's a really good point. I hadn't really thought about that before, but I was, that's a really, really good point. So we need to see, we look, and I don't think Harry, he's is going to be locked into anybody just because, you know, like, I don't think he's going to be locked into Josh Lug. Um, just because he's a 60 year senior. Or yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if Josh isn't the best guy for the job, he won't play. I mean, I just, Agreed. My, he may get more. You you may give a veteran more opportunities to keep that job, but if right. if Rocco's the better guy, they're going to play Rocco, or they're going to play three guards, which is another possibility. Absolutely. And then that takes some of the burden off of Josh Lug, because that's the other thing is if Josh is the best guy, but you're worried about him wearing down, because that's the thing. Last year, Josh really wore down late in the year. He did, and that's where the injuries can kind of take a toll on a kid when he's playing a ton of snaps. There, the, a, a plan might be, hey, look, let's let's work Rocco in there, right? right? Let's get Rocco every third or fourth series. You know, let's let's give him some chance, and then maybe he he takes a third series here, and then he plays some snaps at left guard too. Like you know, get him some opportunities. Maybe he earns that. That would be, I'd be fine with that too. I would be fine with that too because that sets you up yeah. for the future, right? And, and but it also this season helps kind of keep some of that wear and tear off Josh Luck because you got some big games in November, absolutely, and, and, and you need those kids fresh. That. Yes, yeah, you're absolutely. gonna need Josh Lug. Right. Look, you, right. you've had enough. You've had enough of a track record of Josh's injury history. Right. I think to put him. Up, I don't want to say it's a pitch count, but kind, right. but a little bit. You know what I it's mean? Possible, like, but but here's possible. the thing, Vince. You can't you can't force that. You can't force feed that. Absolutely, you, you can't Somebody say, "Well, yeah, Rocco's not ready, but we're gonna have to do this." Because no, you you kind of got to roll with it, right? This is why I say it's a big spring for Rocco Spindler because. Rocco is going to get an opportunity to say, hey, look, Coach Eastan, I don't know what your plan is, but you need to figure it out. I need to play. Yeah, right. 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 What I'm saying is you don't say that. I mean, your play says that. His play tells Coach Eastan that. That's When we say you need to tell them that, we're talking about like doing it with your pads. Like His right. performance is such that, hey, we got to figure out a place to put this kid. And, and, you know, the, and the other thing, too, is then you ask the question, Vince, do you then try to get Rocco some snaps at center? Because you have another guy that's got an injury history, and that's Jarrett Patterson, yeah. right? He got hurt at the end of the 2019 season, missed the last – or 2020 season, excuse me, missed the last, what, four games of the year. 
He got hurt again this year and, and, and you know, and he's going to enter the season, you know, healthy-ish, but he's going to miss a lot of important weight room time. If Rocco does prove to be your next best interior lineman, do you maybe prepare him to say, hey, look, this may be his future? You know, because look, Andrew Kristoffic still has three years left. That's the interesting thing because 2020 didn't count for him. He's technically a redshirt sophomore, even though he's yeah. a senior. So <laughs> if Andrew's playing well, he could start for this year and two more, right? right? And then you've got you've got Billy Shrouth, you've got Joey Tanona, you've got a lot of talented young guys. You got to start thinking kind of like, what's our 2023 line going to look like? Yeah, and maybe Rocco might be a center. I mean, it just those are all the things that make the spring fun because yeah, you know what? Let's see what Rocco. Let's see if Rocco can snap. And he may be terrible at it. He may like say like, nope, sorry, not happening. Go back are, out to guard. It happen. happens. Yeah. yeah, it happens. Yeah. And but it, it may be a thing where like he put him there, like, whoa, this kid's a natural at this, right? And then you start to say, okay, now we feel like he can start anywhere. He's gonna either replace Josh or he's gonna replace Jared. He's gonna replace somebody next year. So let's let's work on you know, but but those are things Rocco has to force that, right? He has to Absolutely. play. He has to work this winter to get in in good shape. He has to work this winter to increase his strength. He has to work this winter on you know this spring on improving his technique and and be more assignment correct and and improve as a pass blocker. I mean, those are the areas where Rocco's game must continue to get better. But the reality is, Vince, we both feel he has the talent to say, "Hey, look, yes. you got to find a role for this kid." And and Coach Eastan has shown in the past that he's not afraid to do that if it's if it's there, you know, and not just with Robert Hainsey, but if you go back and look at 2013. Steve Elmer didn't jump into the starting lineup till later in the year when guys got hurt, but Steve was playing. He was he was he was playing in games before he got thrust into the lineup because of injuries. And so we've seen it at times before where a young guard came in or a young player came in and said, Hey, I, I gotta play, right? I'm I'm too good to play. You can't sit me. And again, when we say say that, he's not verbally saying that. Hey, coach, it's I got to play. Your, it's, with, it's with your pads. Yeah. And I think Rocco has the potential to be that kind of guy. But we got to see it because if, if if there's a gap between him, like a big gap between him and Lug and Kristoffic by the end of the spring, he's, it's going to be too great for him to make it up in the fall. Yeah. And that's oh, fine if it is. I mean, just you know, you just hope that if there is a gap, it's because of how well the older guys are playing, not because right. Rocco doesn't step up his game. Exactly. So that's what's gonna. That's another thing that's gonna make this spring very interesting, Vince. Very well, interesting. yeah. Absolutely. And and not having not having Patterson in the lineup allows you know a guy like Zeke Carell to kind of go back to what I think is his more natural position at at center. Uh, and it, I want to see. I, I you know the biggest criticism I had of Zeke last year when they had him at guard was that it was his strength. He he looked he looked weak at times to me, and so Zeke yeah. Yeah, and Deeper so than he did in 2020, which is the okay. weird part. Absolutely, I I, I just I want to see what an off season kind of looks like right. for him, and I also want to see him at his natural position as center as well. This so. is a this is a make or break off season for Z Carell. Yeah, I agree with I you 100. percent He can get passed because, up. But here's the other thing. This is what's crazy. He's going to be a senior this year. He's got three years of eligibility left. It is crazy because of the COVID year. Because think about yeah. it, 19. He was a redshirted in 19, so that made him a redshirt freshman. But since 2020 didn't count, that means in 2021 he was a redshirt freshman. So he'll be a redshirt sophomore this year. He has three years of eligibility left. Crazy. So again, you it's it's but it's make or break in that you've got too many young guys behind you that if you're still that guy that that can't be assignment correct and is you know just because this is what we heard about him last spring, right? I mean, this is the no, look. Look, sometimes Zeke looks like a million bucks, and sometimes Zeke doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. And that was and then he played like that, right? He right. you know right. the center fix all those things. Because he's going to, if they're going to keep him at center, then he's going to, I'm sorry, it's like weird. I got like an eyelash right on the, my tongue. Um, but if he's back at center, then he's going to get a lot of snaps to kind of get right. himself back in the groove. You're, you're going to know where Zeke is by the end of spring, assuming he can stay healthy. And and that's an interesting one because you say, okay, well, who's the center of the future? It can still be Zeke Carell because this is the thing. If, pa if, if Pat, when Patterson's gone after this year, Zeke Carell still has two years left after that. You you know, it's like, well, you do you really want to start Zeke for a year and then move? Well, you don't have to. He's got two right. years left. Right. And so those are the things you kind of have to look into and say, hey, look, but 
And and again, as as Andrew Gustafik's cousin said, it doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to stay those three years. But it's just, just you start thinking about that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, and and so and with Zeke, especially since Zeke won't have as much starting years on, as Andrew, you know that could be a factor as well. So, and and the other thing too is if you don't make moves this spring, Billy Shrouth and Emil Wagner and Joey Tanona and Ashton Clark and or Ashton Craig and Michael Carmody and Tosh Baker, those guys are all going to be making moves. And Michael Carmody's a guy. It's yeah, very intriguing to me. Yeah, very intriguing. I, to I'm me. interested. Yeah, I'm interested to see kind of where he settles right. position wise, right? right? Because we've right. talked about him at tackle, we've talked about him at guard, and I mean, if, if you're looking at the depth chart, I mean, tackle looks like it's pretty well, you know, fortified for a little while. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and we just got done talking about you know more options at, at center, I mean, at, at guard and how long those guys have. So, yeah, Michael Carmody is a really, a really good question as to where he's going to end up. Right, because I don't think he's a tackle. Like, Because right. one of the questions is, so he's not a tackle. Well, if he's not a tackle, who are your tackles? Because that creates some depth. I mean, so Tosh Baker, I have concerns about whether or not it's too late for Tosh Baker. Yeah. Honestly, like that's, this spring is going to tell us that. Like, he was such a yeah. raw kid. That it's like, is he ever going to get that back? Now he missed two. He missed two incredibly formative years of development because he just wasn't coached well, right? And and that's that's a problem for me. But are, is he going to be back or not? We don't know the answer to that. Caleb Johnson's a guy that I'd like to see. You know, how does what kind of spring does he sure. have? Because if Caleb Johnson can emerge, and all of a sudden Caleb provides you with, you know, a really you know technically sound long you know, kid that could play tackle, maybe could play some guard, but you need somebody to play tackle. Yeah. He can give you that. Right. And and hopefully Tosh can give you that, but it just, I got some concerns about Tosh, you know, just, I need to see him bounce back mentally and technically from what we saw. Cause last year, I mean, he'd have some snaps. You're like, okay, that's a Tosh Baker that I saw. And then there's some other snaps. You're like, Oh my Lord, this kid yeah. couldn't play at max school. Yeah. I had and, a lot I mean, of it, in, in Tosh Baker and his ceiling and what he, like I, I thought he was gonna end up being a tackle, which would the, allow you. The to problem is, Vince, he was high. raw coming out of high school. Yes, I, absolutely. And when you're coached, you be coached. That's exactly right. And he just and he wasn't did not get the coaching that he needed, and it was so clear and obvious. He was a he was a ball of clay that never got molded, and that's the biggest problem. Right. But the question is, is can you afford to move Carmody inside? That's the question. Can you afford to move him inside? Because I'll be honest with you. Michael Carmody intrigues the heck out of me inside as, as an interior player. Because he's a pretty good athlete. That's why they put him at tackle. Because of, of the of the interior type of players, he's the one that had the athleticism to play tackle. The problem for me with Michael Carmody, I don't, I don't doubt Michael Carmody's athletic ability to play tackle. I don't think Michael Carmody has the demeanor to play tackle. Michael Carmody's not a retreating player. This right. is what we've said about Quentin Nelson in the past. I'm not comparing him to Quentin Nelson as a talent. That would be unfair. It's not, I'm talking about from a mentality standpoint of Quentin Nelson was long enough and athletic enough and had the wingspan to play tackle at a yeah. high level in college. Tell Quentin but Nelson, Quentin, he can't play tackle. see how that works for you. Right. And and I think Quentin Nelson could play, you know, right tackle in the NFL. Yeah, right. Physically, like athletically, right. lengthwise, power wise. The problem, not problem. The reason I think he's better as a guard is because he has a guard demeanor. He wants to come off and yeah. hit you. Guards right. don't retreat. Even, even in pass pro, guards don't retreat like tackles. As we talked about this, I think, a week or two ago. That The pocket is like this, right? The tackles are going to give ground. They want to keep you from beating them inside, right. ride you outside. But Fine. the interior guys can't do that because if they give the same kind of ground, then everybody's going to be right in the quarterback's face. Now, a couple right. times last year, it looked like they were doing that. Um, like everybody was in a past, you know what I mean? It's it pretty bad, but you, you you need to be able to hit and engage at the line of scrimmage as a guard all the time. Yes. And that's Carmody's demeanor. Like he has that. I want to, when he got in trouble last year, because often he was too aggressive. He wasn't good getting out of a stance as a tackle. Cause it's like, he just wasn't used to retreating. Right. He's a guy that's going to wants to come off and smack you in the mouth. Right. And, and, like to me, if if I felt good about Caleb Johnson and Tosh Baker as my number twos, I'd give Michael Carmody a shot to move inside and compete for the starting guard at job. I mean, starting job at guard. Wow, that was backwards. Um, <laughs> a starting job at guard. <laughs> like, how did that even come out of my mouth? 
think you're trying to do a guard job. And then, starting guard a job. I don't know. I, I'm trying to help starting you here, man. job at guard. Uh, <laughs> I would I would literally let him battle. I, I, he would be the fifth guy in that battle for me. With Kristoffic, Lug, Rocco. It's a four. No, it'd be, yeah, because I was thinking Zeke. But I want Zeke to focus on I center. I want Zeke to focus on center. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the I think the the Zeke to guard, as much as I advocated for it that I didn't want him to lose his job, and so I wanted him to get a shot at guard. It just didn't it didn't work out, and I, I didn't like him at guard. I just think he's so much better of a player at center. So I right. I agree with you. I think he needs to focus on center because look, you need a good second center. I mean, mm-hmm. if he's not going to start over Patterson, which I don't anticipate that he would, right? But you know, Patterson's out right now, and so this is a great opportunity for for him. But we're not talking about him right, right now. But yeah, I agree with you; he needs to stick at center. Right, but I mean, it's it's part of the conversation about where you're going to play him. So I mean, you have to talk about Patterson to talk about you know ultimately where you want to play Zeke. Right. You know, do you want to give Zeke another chance to start? But see, that's the thing is, if Zeke's out there dominating a center, you say, look, this kid's one of our five best linemen. Let's give him a couple. Let's give him some snaps at guard, and if he looks like he did at guard last year, then you know he just isn't comfortable at guard. Yeah, you know, and and you can just keep him a center, but then he may move to guard and be like, okay, he doesn't look like the dude he did last year. I mean, look, there's a reason that they kept trotting him out at guard, and 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 they saw something in Zeke that they sure. liked. It just sure. the consistency it wasn't there. But when Zeke was right, Zeke was. I mean, he's a tough. You know, he plays with good pad level when he's right. He can get movement when he's right. Uh, he just he 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 just he's too small to to play to play the way he did last year, you know, where when you, where he doesn't anchor yeah, the pad right. level is super inconsistent, wasn't using his hands. And that was an issue with all the linemen. They just didn't use their hands real well. Well, when you're as small as, as Zeke Carell, pardon me, then you're, you're going to, that's a big problem. Right. Big problem that you can't afford to, to, to do. Having to adjust your run game and what you kind of right. want to do. And everything that we just talked about about 20 minutes ago would apply there. Right. You know what I mean? He's not going to be a road grader. That's not, it's just not how he's built at, at the right. guard position. Right. Right. So there's just there's just a lot of questions, but I like the talent. I mean, we and I don't we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the freshmen when it comes to starting because I just don't see any of them being starting caliber players. I mean, we're gonna see Joey Tonona and Billy Shrouth. I don't know how much we're gonna see Billy Shrouth because of the injury. Like he was still on crutches a few weeks ago, right? Like yeah. I don't know how much we're gonna see him. Joey Tonona is a kid that I'm very intrigued by, but with Joey, it's more of, of a how does he position himself for next spring when they lose some guys? Sure. You know, when they lose Patterson, when they lose Chris, you know, when they lose uh Lug, how does he position himself? Like what does he show this spring that helps him kind of find a two deep role in the fall that then puts him in position to say, hey, center right guard, one of those two spots is gonna be mine next spring, right? And then that's that's what the spring's going to be about for him is learning how to go about his business every day. That's what the spring's going right. to be for Joey. Learn how to go about your business every day. You know, absorb the technical aspects and just to try to apply them as much as you can because those are the things that are going to that are going to give Joey a chance to really make a jump in his first year is is being able to play the technical part of the game because the physical tools are there. I mean, he's big. He's he's got he's got some strength. He's a decent he's a decent athlete to tackle. He's a good athlete inside, in my opinion. He's got some size. He's got some toughness. I mean, Vince, you've seen film of him. He's an Indiana kid. I mean, he's he's kind of what you expect an Indiana lineman to be, right? Tough yeah. kid, you know, likes to fight and compete and battle, and he moves better than maybe you'd expect. So it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be some, a he's gonna need rough fine tuning though, because a right. lot of a lot of Indiana linemen, and I'm I'm lumping, obviously, but mm-hmm. there's just the talent level in Indiana in general. You're right. basically if you're bigger and stronger, you're going to win. And right. so I, he needs to be fine tuned with technique and all that. And now there's a coach that can do that. And that's right. That's, right. In, that's very promising. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how he develops. That's right. that's going to be exactly. now. Is it again? Are we talking about Joey Tenota developing to the level that's going to allow him to compete for starting? No, we're not saying that. We're not we're not going there. Right. Doesn't mean it make it doesn't make it less important for him to have a good spring. Exactly. Right. And that's the big thing. And then, you know, kind of the final piece to all this, Vince, is as we as we look at it and say, how quickly does the line fully embrace the standard that Harry Heastan is going to set? And that was the interesting thing that I had in my in my intel piece on offense last week was, you know, the comments that the players were told by 
you know, the staff that, hey, look, if you think you know what the standard was based on your experiences thus far, you don't know what the standard is. Hmm. And and it, it, you, but you're going to find out in a hurry. Meaning, there's a level of excellence that's going to be demanded of you, but you're going to be taught it as well, right? Like that's the thing. You can't demand players to do something that you're not teaching them to do, right? Or exactly. not teaching them to do. And that's the key. How quickly do they take to that? How quickly do they start to be able to apply those things to their games? I think those are the things I'm going to be looking for this spring. Is okay. We're seeing. We're immediately within the first couple of practices that we have open. We're seeing, okay, yeah, they're already applying some of those lessons. They're right. competing their butts off. They're using their hands better. Their footwork is better. Uh, you know, they're 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 finishing blocks off better. They're getting more movement in the run game. Those are the things that we're going to want to look at and say, hey, yep, this is this is this is what a line at Notre Dame is supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. This is what it's supposed to look like. And, and that's, that's the kind of the gauges that we're going to have, the things that we're going to be able to see as we kind of work through the spring and say, okay, the, the, the progress is being made, right? The progress is being made. Now it's time to, to take it to that next level. And, and those are the things that, that I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, play themselves out because Absolutely. right. That's going to be the key. It's a compete That's level, just all of that, and you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to see it fairly quickly, I think. And I, and I know that's going to be one of the questions that gets asked even after Thursday. And I don't know that I'll have an answer that day, but I still think there's going to be inklings and there's going to be pieces that you're going to be able to tell the difference. I, I do, mm-hmm. uh, but again, you have to temper your expectations for the spring um, a, a little bit. I, I want. Dude, I want you to explain that because I want to make sure what people because what we don't what we're not going to do is in this we talk about this Marcus Freeman it's like there's a perception like well you didn't like Brian Kelly you like Marcus Freeman oh, oh, personally yeah it's true but the standards <laughs> the standard whether I like the coach or not I mean I'm, right. I'm not going to be okay with a nine to three season because I happen to personally like the head football coach right standards the standard I'm not going to lower the expectations for Harry Heastan in the fall because I like him more than Jeff Quinn or think he's a better coach for Jeff Quinn than Jeff Quinn. If anything, we raised them. Yeah, 100%. You know what I mean? But w- w- so what we're saying is not like, well, hey, it's if the line sucks, it's going to be okay. Right. But what we are saying is like, look, this line isn't going to go out there and look like the 2017 line did in Mike Elko's first spring. It's not going to look like that. We're trying to give you these are the things you can look for, however, that are right. going to give you a good sense of – are they making the strides necessary to where we will then see that in the fall? Right. That is the thing. And and that is, again, getting movement at the line of scrimmage. The compete level needs to go up, right? Hand play needs to improve. Finishing blocks. Are they working their feet through contact? And what we mean is the big complaint, you and I, one of the, one of the big complaints we had technically in recent years was they would hit stop. and stop, stop moving stop. their feet. Yes. Right. And then the other one was, is they would catch. So they would step, but not get any vertical movement step and accept the engagement as opposed to in, in initiating contact. Right. right. Well, that's going to change. That should change under Harry Heastan based on what Coach Heastan has done in the past. And so those are the things you look for. Now, it's not always going to look like, wow, that's a Joe Moore. Like you said, Vince, that's a Joe Moore award winning offensive line. Right. But that doesn't mean you're not going to start to see, you should start to see those things manifest. And so, you know, winning more battles maybe than they did last spring, you know, seeing. You know, hitting and working your feet and and using your hands better, getting extension once engaged, you know, getting to the second level because they were terrible. This past, even in 2020, they weren't great at getting the second level. They just got so much movement at the point of attack that they didn't always need to. Right. And that was really the only year we've seen this line get movement at the point of attack. And so those are the things that we're going to look for. You know, are they going to alter the pass sets to make them, you know, where you got to give ground in the pass set? But they were like, like it was just a weird backpedal and they were just letting guys get up under their chest last year. Does that get corrected? Those are all things that, that we're going to be able to evaluate and see the growth from last season. It's just what we're saying is, but it's still spring. Exactly. Right? And it's exactly. this, the, the, it's, you know, I, I'll say now and people aren't going to listen to me, but don't, get too wrapped up on what the quarterbacks do in the blue gold game in either direction. Right. Good right? or bad. Because people were ready yeah. to hand Tyler Buckner the starting job last year because he shredded the third team defense. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's a, it's building blocks. The spring is a building block. 
And ideally, you don't want any decisions to be definitively made in the spring because it mean it usually means somebody's not playing well, as opposed right. to somebody looks phenomenal. You want a battle, right? And so those are the things that we look for, and um, that's what I'm excited to see from the spring. And the talent's there, Vince. I mean, there's there's no question the talent okay. is there. No the question. depth, even with the injuries, there's plenty of depth. There's plenty of bodies. There's plenty of players out there. I mean, you know, does Pat Coogan make us look stupid this spring for not thinking much of him and completely ignoring him in this conversation, basically? Right. Now, does he come out and show the tough? Because one thing I'll say about Pat Coogan is I don't think he's athletic enough to play at a place like Notre Dame. But one thing he did have coming out of high school was a high compete level. He was a battler. He was a scrapper. You know, does does do they need some of that? Does he show some of that? There's all types of storylines are going to be fun to see. The, during the spring that are going to tell us about whether or not this line is prepared to take that next step. Because that Absolutely. right there is the big thing is, is if this team is going to be, is going to live up to the standard of what Notre Dame football should be, which means you enter the month of November with a chance to play for a title, right? That should be the standard. You know, some years they're going to get there. Some years they're not, but are you entering that? Are you, are you playing? Are you winning tr- in the trenches? Are you the more physical team on the football field? Are you, right able to go out there and, and take your offense to that next level. All the things that we say this program needs to be about, it all starts up front on offense. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, and like we said at the beginning, that's going to impact the defense too. Because if you're conditioned every single day in practice that you better meant – this is what Mike Elko had said. I'm, I can't remember if it was a public comment that he made or if this was a comment he made in a, in, in a, in a question that I had posed to him in, a, in a, a more one-on-one setting. But he said – the greatest thing about going against those guys is our guys couldn't take mental days off in the spring and in fall camp. Because if you took a mental day off, you're going to get hurt. Like you're going to physically get hurt by Quentin Nelson or Mike McGlinch or Alex Bars or, or Sam Musford. Like they were so competitive and strong that they didn't – because who, who was their leader? It was Quentin Nelson. He didn't take days off. Right. And if Q's not taking a day off – I'm not taking a day off. Exactly. And so it raised the compete level of the defense. Right. So when they went and played Georgia's big old line, I was like, so what, dude? I don't care who you are. I've been right. going against Quentin Nelson for the last two months. Right. Right. I've been going against McGlinchy. And so it raised their comp- compete level. It raised their standard. Hey, and, and it raised their ability to focus. Like, hey, Foskey, you can't take the day off because otherwise Blake will destroy you. You know, you can't, hey, so, you know, Howard Cross, you can't take the day off or Josh Lug's going to, pancake you five times right like right. those are the things that that have to that's the kind of thing we need to see because it doesn't just impact the line when the line is that way it raises your whole because what vince well, you and i talked about this off the air and and i think we a friend of mine were talking what are the years that we felt notre dame really had a legitimate chance to play for a national title right where they felt that team if was if it was coached right that team could have beat anybody it was 15 and 17 those also Old happen to be the two best offensive line of, classes yeah, that Notre exactly. Dame's, teams in Notre Dame's ever had. Yes, because yes. it sets a standard, right. right? So Sheldon Day's going out there balling on Saturdays because it's like this is nothing. I, you know, you guys know what I've been going against in practice every single day. Right, this is nothing, and and I think that's the excitement. But we need to start seeing those steps. It's not right. going to look like a finished product, but we are going to see those steps. So I just wanted to make sure people understand we're not lowering the bar. We're not just setting a proper expectation on what you can look for in the spring. That's then going to set the stage for them going out in the fall and proving that they can and should be one of the best offensive lines in the country. They're not and playing they Ohio State in April. Like they, they're, there's, you know, a buildup. There's time. Otherwise, the $10 ticket I bought today would have cost a whole lot more for the game <laughs> at the end of the spring. It would cost a whole lot more if it was Ohio State. There's no question about it. You can't uh, even get parking for, you know, you got to pay. No. No. Five times as much of that just to get parking to you know when yeah. Ohio State comes to town in a couple of years. So, um, so that's going to be it for today's offensive line podcast. Don't go anywhere because we are going to get to our Q and A section. But Vince, thanks for so much for uh, uh, for for the offensive line talk. I know you've been chomping at the bit. You were like, can we put that first? I'm so uh, excited so- about this group. I seriously, that's going to be one of the main focuses that I've got when I yeah. go on. Days. Well, the good like- news is for you is I'm going to actually have you looking at that. So you and I are going to have a conversation about what to look for, uh, you know, um, when you when you get there. <laughs> yes, sir. So, all right. all right, man. Thanks, Vince. See you, Vince. All right. So now Ryan Roberts joins us and it's Q&A time, Ryan. And obviously we spent uh, we spent the first portion of today's show talking about the Notre Dame offensive line and just kind of what the standard are. So. You know, Ryan, just do you have before we kind of dive into some questions, do you have any 
just some thoughts on kind of what you're looking for, what you're hoping to see from the offensive line this spring. Yeah, no, I think you made a great point. I was listening a little bit earlier and you were talking about it's it's so much promise and so much so much um so much so many high standards for what the tackles are this year that you kind of forget that both of them are just entered their true sophomore season and Blake mm-hmm. Fisher he's only played in two football games, right? So I think that spring I would expect that there's gonna be a little bit of a transitional period, right? I expect that there's gonna be a lot of kinks. I I expect there's gonna be a lot of teaching especially in the mm-hmm. spring. So let's mm-hmm. temper the expectations early on. In my opinion, for the offensive tackles, they're going to be a great group. I'm excited about the pairing, but let's see the, I want to see the, I want to see how much better they get from practice one until the end of right. spring. And I want to see that. I really want to see the competition inside. It stinks that Jared yeah. Patterson is going to be limited, obviously, but it's going to give opportunities for a lot of other guys to get snaps, get added, you know, reps. See, I mean, we think maybe Zeke Corral's the, the center after Jared Patterson. Maybe it's mm-hmm. an Andrew Kristoffic. Maybe it's a Rocco Smith. Like you have no idea where that center position is going to go. So I think it's a really interesting conversation to see, you know, the, just the competition inside and then the development of our sophomore offensive tackles for Notre Dame. Yeah, it's going to be a fun spring. I'm very much looking forward to the spring. So obviously spring ball starts off on Thursday, Ryan, and then uh, Notre Dame also is going to have a lot of guys on campus this week and recruiting. So uh, just real quick, obviously for those that uh, that maybe didn't know, Cardinal Tate is, I believe, on campus now, right, at Notre Dame. So we had some yeah. intel on on him and just kind of questions about just how long he's going to stay and you know kind of where things where things stand for him. And then also, of course. Uh, was it Friday? Th- Friday is when Braylon James arrives. Saturday is when Samuel and Pemba arrives. And there's a potential new visitor. It's not completely locked in stone yet, but there's a potential new visitor that's going to be on campus this week. And that is Jeremiah Love, Ryan. We're going to have a story up here in a little bit. And we've got some intel on the board, but just give the people a little taste of sort of what's the latest with Jeremiah Love, the running back out of the 2023 running back slash athlete out of St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, he has played everywhere for Christian brothers um, out there in St. Louis and he's played, he told me that he thinks he could play running back, cornerback, safety, wide receiver, if you needed him to on the next level, Notre Dame, of course, offered him as a running back, adding him to the 2023 board. And he notified me yesterday that he will be on campus. He was not sure if it would be Thursday or Friday. It's very dependent upon him and his dad are obviously taking the, taking the visit. And they are also uh, planning a trip to Missouri at some point this week mm-hmm. as well. So he will be on campus as to when it is exactly. It's going to be Thursday or Friday. It's an interesting one. It's a really interesting one because for the, I mean, he's a relatively new recruit. And I mean, Brian, it's been a really busy <laughs> couple months mm-hmm. for him, man. I mean, he he's up to 29 reported offers now, but tw- 24 of them have come since January. So he's really starting to blow up on the trail. And he's a guy that we talked a lot about, like with the usage of him, right? Because I think he only had 95 rushes last year mm-hmm. for nearly a thousand yards over 10 yards a clip you're like why is he not run- touching the ball a little more well it's because he does a lot of things for his football mm-hmm. team obviously so they had another pretty good back on that team as well exactly yeah and it's i mean so he's a really interesting long athletic kid that i mean notre dame seems interested in he seems very interested in them you know a couple inside tidbits in there but Family is definitely very fond of Notre Dame. Some coworkers around the mom is very fond of Notre Dame. So I think there's going to be a little push for him to end up with the Irish if the Irish make the make the real big push for him. So I'm excited about Jeremiah Love getting on campus, and I, I can't wait to catch up with him after the visit just to see how everything goes because it is his first time on campus. So it's, yes, very, very interesting. And I'm very curious how the board shakes out because you also had an update on Jay Lamar, who's, a, who's probably yeah. – the only other realistic running back option, neither of us believe that Justice Haynes is going to end up in Notre Dame. If we yeah. look at guys who could play running back, I think the two are, um, obviously, we talked about Jeremiah Love, who could play other positions, but they are recruiting him as a running back right now, and then Jaden Lamar. So I know you had an update, a little bit of an update on Jaden Lamar. What is the latest with Notre Dame and Jaden Lamar? Yeah, I mean, he's been a guy that's been talked about over the last couple ga- couple days. I think there was a future cast pick that was put in for him to end up with Notre Dame. So I wanted to obviously get be able to touch base with him because I, I hadn't actually talked to him since, I think, either late January or early February. And at that point, it was, you know, Lance Taylor was still a part of the, part of the uh, program. I guess it was probably earlier in January. And obviously, there was a transitional period going to Dylan McCullough, running back coach. So I just wanted to check in with him, see what his plans were. So he has... 
Uh, three official visits planned. He did not want to disclose this to me because he wanted to announce all of his official visits at once during that mm-hmm. during that trip. But he does have the um, he has the plan right now tentatively to be on campus for the spring game, which. Man, the visitor list for that game is getting absurd, <laughs> to say the least. So get in. Jaden Lamar is going to be big. He's been on campus before, but getting him to take the trip back to Notre Dame is going to be a big one, I believe. I, I am not – I mean, I'm not nearly to the point where, like, that future cast is, right? Like, I, I don't think that Notre mm-hmm. Dame is the favorite for Jaden Lamar. I think that they both like each other, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But there's just something to this one where I think that staying out west may be a more likely – kind of conversation to Jaden right now but I mean obviously things can sway if he has a great time at the spring game but we'll see obviously as that gets verified and that gets finalized and you know plane tickets are are bought and all that type of stuff Mm -hmm. that'll be kind of a little more realistic but I I think that Jaden's in a good place with Notre Dame he really was very complimentary of Dylan McCullough and the conversations he's had with him but anytime there's a transition from a position coach like we saw from Taylor to McCullough there's going to be some questions about like what's the next step. And I think that Jane is still very interested, but I think that there's a long way to go for Notre Dame right now. And before we dive into questions, I did want to get to this from Reese's Chris says, I'm hope I'm hopping on only for a moment right now, but I'm listening in later. I would love IB nation's thoughts and prayers for my family and especially my dad, Dennis, uh, as my mom passed away yesterday. So I'm really, really terribly sorry to hear that Uh, Reese's Chris. I, um, yeah, I, you, you. All I can say is you have our prayers. You have our thoughts, our sympathies, and our prayers. There's no question about it. And we'll keep, we'll keep Dennis, and we'll also keep you and your entire family in your prayers. And I pray that your mom, um, you know, that your mom is in a a, a better place now. So we'll, you, you, you know, everybody always knows if you come here and you need need prayer support, we always got it, and that's why we call it an IB family. So it's not just a not just a site or a, a YouTube channel. It's also a community, and so you've uh, we got your back. There's no question about it. And now the awkward tr- transition into questions, but we always want to bring those things up. David Solomon kicks things off and he says, uh, wasn't he stand, wasn't Quinn, he stands assistant O-line coach. We didn't have this problem on defense when Mike Elko left and Clark Lee was left in charge. Okay, three things. Number one, he was not, he stands assistant. He worked with the tight ends. Coach he stand wouldn't let Jeff Quinn in the offensive line room from what I'm told. And, uh, so he worked more with the off with the tight ends. He was not Harry Heastan's assistant. Number one. Number two, um, Clark Lee was a full-time position coach. Jeff Quinn was an analyst. Analysts aren't on the field coaching. Clark Lee was on the field coaching. Clark Lee also had been with Mike Elko for longer than just one year at Notre Dame. He was with him at Wake Forest. So there was obviously a longer connection there. And then three, there's a talent level. Clark Lee is a more talented football coach than Jeff Quinn. That's no disrespect to Coach Quinn. I've said a million times, I personally like Jeff Quinn, but he's not an elite football coach. Clark Lee was a very good football coach. And so all of those things are going to continue that. And also Clark Lee and Mike Elko, I think, naturally had a lot of things in common. That's why they click so well as coaches. And so Clark Lee wasn't running Mike Elko's defense, and then he was wishing he was running something different. They connected because I think they both had very similar philosophies on what a great defense should look like or what a defense should look like. Harry Heastan and Jeff Quinn did not have similar views on how to make an offensive line work at a high level. And that's why one was successful and the other one wasn't for many. What's one of many reasons why. So um, the the situations are nothing, nothing uh, alike at all. So um, it shouldn't be really a discussion beyond that. Irish Marine 51 SFMF. Thank you for your service very much, sir. I really do appreciate the true honesty from both of your standpoints. Uh, I don't want smoke and mirrors. We are all grownups here at Go Irish. You will always get the truth here. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether it's good news or bad news, and we're going to be wrong sometimes, but we're always going to give you an honest opinion and an honest assessment. Uh, whether whether we're right or wrong, we'll always give you an honest assessment. And then Michael Campbell says, why are you guys here and not picking up Carnell Tate? Good afternoon, IB Nation. So, yeah, we – uh. We didn't want to commit a recruiting violation. And so that's why, Michael, we decided not to be the ones picking up Cardinal Tate. Plus him and his mom are driving here, so they should be should be fine. The world-famous Scotty Nitro. Is it well-known the, the way he stand feels about Kelly? Some say there is a lot of Kelly and Reese. I know Reese lobbied for he stands return. Any word on their working relationship? I, I, I don't I, – when somebody says there's a lot of Kelly and Reese, that's referring to their football personalities. 
Uh, Harry Heastan's problem with Brian Kelly, from what I'm told, wasn't because they didn't wasn't necessarily because they didn't see eye to eye football wise. It's they didn't see eye to eye personally. Tommy Reese is not Brian Kelly's puppet. He doesn't walk around acting like Brian Kelly. He's been influenced by Brian Kelly as a football coach. And I think those are things that there's been some concerns about. Although I think Tommy Reese's comments after he decided not to go with Brian Kelly for more money uh, says that Tommy was looking for a, a start to kind of be his own guy, which I think is important. But this notion that that you know, he there's a lot of Kelly and Reese, football-wise, maybe, but not personally. I think that was mm-hmm. the bigger issue. But you got to remember, Tommy Reese's relationship with Harry Heastan is very much different than, than Brian Kelly's relationship. Tommy had a longer relationship with Harry Heastan as a player coach than he did as a pr- colleague's. They were colleagues for a year. That was it. One year, 2017. Uh, Harry Heastan was Tommy Reese's offensive line coach for two seasons. The year that Tommy Reese only got sacked eight times an entire season was with Harry Heastan coaching offensive line. So if I, if that was me, I'd love the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I only got sacked eight times. And I don't even know if all those sacks were of Tommy because I think Andrew Hendricks got sacked once or twice uh, in the USC, USC game when Tommy got hurt. Uh, I'd have to go back and look that up. But so that relationship began then. So just from the beginning, the foundation of their relationship came at a whole different level. And there's a great deal of respect. Coach Reese mentioned in the in the interview, the the interview as far as when they announced the new coaches, uh, him and Coach Eastan had stayed in contact bef- even before they coached together in 2017. Like when Tommy got done being a player in 13, that kind of three year stretch in between 14, 15, and 16, they stayed in contact. I think he said Ryan what was it like they they did talk at least once a month. During that period of time, yeah, so like that. Th- yeah, there's clearly a strong connection there, and and I don't think that um, I don't think it'd be fair, in my opinion, to say Tommy is like Reese personally in the ways that Coach Eastan and Kelly didn't get along. That was um, that was quite different. Here's one, Ryan. Florida Irish says buy or sell. The Notre Dame offensive line will dominate a weaker Ohio State defensive line, but be more up and down for most of the first half of the season until hitting its stride in November buy or sell on, I, I guess that's kind of two things together, yeah. but yeah, let's take that entire premise. I know I, where I'm going I'm with not, that one. I, I might, I think I'm going to buy that one actually, because I'm just thinking about it. I mean, Ohio state has Zach Harrison coming back. Who's a little bit of an overrated football player at defensive end to begin with. And they are, I mean, they lost, they lost um, Haskell Garrett inside. They lost Tyreek Smith. So they're going to be breaking in a lot of new guys into this rotation. And I know like Teron Vincent, I think, is coming back from Ohio State, who's was a big recruit but hasn't done a ton at Ohio State. So I think there's going to be a lot of new faces on de- that defensive line. So I actually do think that Notre Dame has probably the upper hand, definitely on a talent level, especially early on. So I'll, I'll buy that they have a really nice show against Ohio State and then maybe, you know, settles in into you know a little more up and down play until they really hit their stride mid-season i think that's kind of where i'm lying on that one i'm selling because while i while i think that notre dame can beat ohio state up front i don't think that they're going to dominate ohio state i don't think ohio state is also a weak defensive off defensive line and and I think, number one, they're going to play in a system that is more dependent upon them making plays, which I think should help. How much of that they're going to be able to do by game one, I don't know. Zach Harrison is overrated, but he still has talent. And, and you, you know, Talik Williams comes back. They've got uh, JT Tui Maloa coming back. He was a five-star kid as a freshman last year that didn't enroll in Ohio, at Ohio State till super late, didn't go mm-hmm. through spring. I always felt he was also an overrated player in that people thought he was like a top five national player, but he's still pretty good. There's good players there. There's just not elite players. So I don't think they're weak. I think you could make the case that they're a t- tad overrated from a talent standpoint, but I wouldn't call them weak. Uh, yeah. That I just, I wouldn't quite go there. I think the system sucked to be completely honest yeah. with you. And I think that mask, because we've made that case about Notre Dame players. Like, Hey, those guys are better than that. But here's the thing. Ohio State's defensive line wasn't good last year. Who was worse last year, Ryan? Ohio State's D-line or Notre Dame's offensive line? That's <laughs> fair. It's a fair point. Offensive <laughs> line. That's a fair point. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, coaching can impact those type of things. Uh, yeah. As far as being up and down, I think we'll see some of that the first month. I think we'll see some of that yeah. through the bye week. I think we'll start to see them hit their stride coming out of the bye week when they go play BYU. I think 
I think the combination of four games plus the bye and then the emotional challenge of playing BYU. Because I think BYU for a well-coached team is a team that you're going to watch film and say – and Harry Heastan, remember, Harry Heastan and Tommy Reese have played and coached against BYU before. They twice in 12 and 13. And both games were battles. So they're going to know these kids – look, guys, you're 19, you're facing a dude that's 25 right? It's a bit stereotypical, but that's, that's in some cases, that's true. These yeah. guys are going to come at you. They're going to battle. They're going to play hard. They're going to be fundamentally sound. You better, it's a lunch pail game. I think mm-hmm. that challenge, that mental challenge that they're going to have to reach up to is then going to be the thing that I think springboards them into success for the rest yeah. of the year. So I do think we'll see some of that. I think the bye week is really set up perfectly for this offensive line. You have the big test at the beginning. And then if we're being honest, you have three sort of get right games right Mm -hmm. against Marshall Cal and then North Carolina you're not going to be facing elite talent North Carolina's going to have some some young talented kids but they're just not a great defense and I know they got a new defensive coordinator but a lot of it was I thought their defensive coordinator was awful but he wasn't the only problem he was the main problem he wasn't the only problem Uh, so I think they got three get right games where they'll have some up and downs, but they'll still be able to do enough to where you're like, okay, this, once this, once the light goes on, these guys gonna be really good. So I'm Mm -hmm. going to, I'm going to sell that one. I'm going to sell that one. Three, three certainties for BYU. They're going to be mature. They're going to be physical and there's going to be a Kafusi playing on defense. (laughs) This is true. (laughs) This is very, very true. Very true. Rob Compton says, do you see any scenario where Baker plays right tackle and Blake plays Tosh Baker plays right tackle and Blake Fisher plays guard? Not not Blake Fisher, Tosh Baker, like in a perfect world where Tosh Baker maximizes his potential. I could see that. I just don't think it's going to happen. Could I see a scenario, Ryan? Yes. Would I predict mm-hmm. that scenario right now? No, no, I'm yeah. not going there. I mean, I don't think we've seen. I don't think we've seen anything out of the first two years, and I know that the deck was stacked against him from mm-hmm. for Tosh's perspective. But I don't think we've seen anything that would indicate that he's going to take that massive leap. I think I do think in the ideal scenario, Tosh Baker plays to his potential, and he's one of the best five, and he forces the hands right. But I, I don't think that you can. You definitely can't predict that right now because it's just not. Right something you've seen enough of to be confident in that you've seen Blake play well at right tackle, although in, in limited amount of time, you've seen Joel play well at tackle. And, and although in a limited amount of time, you've seen Jared Patterson be good. Like those are the certainties on the offensive line this year. They, J- Tosh Baker is a big wild card, but mm-hmm. it's hard to bet on a wild card sometimes. Right. Agree. Chris Ayers asks tough question here. Joe Moore or Harry he stand. I mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here, but Joe Moore's passed away. I mean, I mean, so for like, I mean, so like obviously right now he's passed away. I think the question is more of who's in their prime. Look, uh, I don't know the Joe Moore that coached and won a title at Pitt. I I, I wasn't even born. I think I might, maybe I was a year old. No, when did they win the title? Was it 76? They won the title. I wasn't even born yet. 70s. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Joe Moore was a great coach. But I mean, you talk to anybody from that era, Joe Moore was a, a, a really great coach, but Joe Moore also wasn't – he didn't recruit anybody. I mean, Vinny Serrato did all the recruiting, from what I'm told. So, sure. I mean, you know, I, I I have no frame of reference other than – I mean, uh, when he was at Notre Dame, I was in middle school and high school, right? I have, I've mm-hmm. – not, not even, actually. I think he was pretty much gone by the time I basically got to high school or at least was like on the downside of his career. So – when when they were really good, he I was eight to I was like ten to twelve years old, so I, I really have no frame of reference. So just knowledge, I'd go with Harry Heastan just because I know Harry Heastan, know what he's done. I only know Joe Moore from reputation. Say, well, he's got an award named after him. Well, yeah, because he hasn't been. I mean, how many guys get awards named after him while they're still coaching? It doesn't happen very often, you know. Exactly. But yeah. I mean, Joe Moore was a legend. I mean, he won a title at Pitt. He won a title at Notre Dame. He was considered a great developer of talent. Um, you know. Harry Heastan doesn't have that first part. He's developed some great players, doesn't have a title. So if you're going to just look at resumes, I mean, you know, you go with, you go with, I think you'd have to go with Joe Moore. But mm-hmm. of who I know, I'd have to go with Harry Heastan. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Ryan. I mean, I think we talked about it before, and I'm in the same boat. It's like I, I never saw Joe Moore coach live, you know, in my lifetime. So I, I mean, you would almost have to defer in that sense to Harry mm-hmm. Easton because he's a known commodity to you. But ultimately, I am going to defer to Joe Moore just for the simple fact that 
the most outstanding offensive line coach is, right. you know, and, and the award is named after Joe Moore. Right. So and he's got two I'm titles. Gonna, I mean, that, that exactly. can't be this. He's, he's coached on two offensive lines. And I believe he was the offensive line coach when Tony Dorsett had just a monster season at Pitt. And he put plenty. I mean, I think he, he coached Bill Fralick, right? Or no, it wasn't Bill Fralick. Uh, uh, Jimbo Covert. I know Jimbo he coached Covert. Jimbo Covert at, you know, yeah. on, on those lines. So, you know, again, I just I have no frame of reference other than just what's on his paper resume, right? Like I know of the reputation and all those type of things, but I mean, resume, Joe Moore gets the honor of what I know, who I know, Harry Easton, you know, would be the guy that I would go with. So I hope that that that, that makes sense. Irish Marine 51 asks, what do you rate this offensive line as of now? When do you possibly think Notre Dame could run run for the natty? Thanks, guys. So Ryan, we'll take that. It's two kind of distinctly different questions. Let's go with the first one. Where do you rate the Notre Dame offensive line now? So let's go like a scale of one to 10. Last year's line being a three, I believe is what you said the other day, right? Yes. Uh, The 2017 line being a, let's just say nine, Mm -hmm. right? And then 10 being, I mean, I'd have to think of, you know, like what 10 would be just like the greatest offensive line ever, right? So where, where do you rate this line now? And where and I'm going to add an on to it. He says as of now, I'm going to add a second piece to it, Ryan. Where do you think the line is going to be by the end of the year? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think there's just natural progression, right? So I would probably say probably a five. I mean, talent level wise, I think you could argue they're even higher than that. Maybe like a six mm-hmm. or seven just to start out. And I mean, projection wise, I think they could be in the seven conversation. You know, I think that they can be one of the five to 10 best offensive lines in, in college football when the season ends. Mm-hmm. I think that that progression is very possible. So the talent level is there. It's going to be about prog- progression. I think right now you, you stay somewhere around a five. It's kind of like a neutral position to begin with. And you hope that the talent is developed properly. And you would assume that it would be. Mm-hmm. I'm going six right now. The reason I say that is talent plus you have a line coach with a proven track record. I mean, this is the thing we talked about at the beginning, Ryan, and you didn't get a chance to comment on it. You were watching but not here is Harry Heastan, Wick. there's three potential versions of Harry Heastan I think realistically we're going to get, right? A new and improved version who's, you know, his kids are out of the house now. He's gotten He's had time to rest. He's fired up, and he's going to be even a better version of himself. The same dude that he was before, Just per, those two options are pretty good, or a guy that's not quite to the standard he was before, but is still, I mean, Harry Heastand at 90% of his former self is still a really good offensive line coach. That's still a top 15 offensive line coach, right? Which is better than what Notre Dame had. So the combination of experience, you have eight guys with at least two starts coming back. The combination of talent, I think we all agree that this is a, a line with a lot of talent. And the fact that there is a jump in, in coaching, immediately just minimum, to me, puts the floor at six, which is that of a good, solid offensive line. Now, can they be better than that? That remains to be seen. I think by the end of the year, I think they can. And and, uh, I think we've been asked this question before, and I've I've kind of, you know, I don't remember what my answer was before, but right now, probably eight would be my guess for where it could be this year. I don't think think this line is going to be as good as you said seven or eight before. Seven or eight. eight. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't expect it to get to the level it was in 2017. I don't think it's going to, and I I think the the discussion would be too, it'd be interesting is which line was better. The 15 line or the 17 line, you know, and I think that's where we can have a fun conversation because you could say, well, the run blocking in the 17 line was better. The pass blocking in the 2015 line was better, you know, and, and so it'd be a fun conversation to have, but uh, you know, I, I don't think it like those two, to me, those two years were nines for me, Ryan, they were nines. I, it, I don't know if that this unit's capable of getting there now, maybe when Joe and Blake and those guys are juniors, maybe, but that's that's quite a high standard. I think eight's probably the ceiling for this group in twenty twenty two. What what are your what are your thoughts on the ceiling? I know we like I said I think we discussed this a week yeah. ago. What is your what is your thoughts on the ceiling for that? I'm relatively in the same ballpark. I think the last time we were asked this, I said a seven. I, I could get to an eight potentially because I think that the the ceiling at the tackle positions is really incredible obviously right and i think that that's obviously the most two important that's the most important positions to make sure that you have locked down on the offense uh, offensive tackle like you need to figure that out especially left tackle so i think the there's a baseline with guys like jared patterson and some experience coming back like krustafik and the two tackles but i also think the ceiling is incredibly high for this group and Mm -hmm. i mean jared patterson's the guy that is like the very known commodity but even his game could get 
considerably yes. better. Like he could yes. be, a, he can go from a very good potent, you know, borderline all American type player to a first round draft pick. Like that is very possible for a guy mm-hmm. like Jared Patterson. So I think the ceiling is incredibly high. I, don't, I wouldn't go Joe Moore finalist this year, but I do think that the ceiling is they should substantial. Be, they should be a legit semifinalist this year. That's top yeah, 10. Right. Right, Agreed. like they should be there. Are they going to be good enough to be finalists? They have a shot. It's just I'm not. Let me see them get through the spring first before I say yes. Because, like you said, there's still our who's going to play guard. Like, I mean, who who's going to be here? Who's going who's going to make this jump? That jump? The other thing. So, uh, definitely the expectation is the floor for me at this group is they should be a, a Joe Moore Award semifinals. Not and not like they were in was it 2019 or 20 2019? I think they were semifinalists and it was on reputation alone. It was not a semifinal playing line. When I say semifinals, I mean legitimate. Like I don't care if they get named or not. They could get named just because Harry He stands there, and uh, guys that are voting for it like Harry He stand. I'm talking about they they've earned being a semifinalist, meaning you're a top ten offensive line. That should be the floor for this group. Now, can they be top five? That's the bigger question for me. And so I think that's that's what where I would where I would go with that one, just in my opinion. Irish Marine fifty one says Brian and Vince and Ryan will will let you replace Vince here. What do you think the difference is going to be with Notre Dame offense and defense this year? So let's say what's the one thing that is going to be the biggest difference between on offense and on defense this season for you, Ryan? Um, I, I think that, I mean, I think there's just a little more known commodity defensively, right? Like you're going to be depending on guys offensively. I mean, we just mentioned the two tackles. You're a first year starting quarterback, obviously, in Tyler Buckner in theory. Your running backs that are going to now have to take on a larger workload. You are expecting Lorenzo Styles and a couple of younger guys to take that next step forward. I mean, there's really, I mean, you have Jared Patterson, I said, is a known commodity, even though I think he could get better. You have Michael Mayer, who's a known commodity, but I think defensively, like, you know, what you're going to get out of Isaiah Foskey and maybe even more. You know what you're going to get out of Jason Amalola. You know what you're going to get out of Cam Hart. I think that there's just a little more understanding of exactly what the floor is for the defense, if that makes it makes sense comparative to the offense. And I, I just think that it's a little more of a known commodity. So I think the experience factor goes to the defense, at least at the beginning of the year at, at, at worst. I think for me, the biggest difference we're going to see on offense this year, I think is going to be, I expect this unit to be a little bit more of a big play group. I think that's the big difference for me. I think we're going to see more big plays. And I think it's just, uh, I think the offensive line is going to be part of that. We're going to see bigger holes or more well-blocked runs. But I think when you just look around the, the, the makeup of the, of the, of the offense, you've got Michael Mayer, who's, you know, one of the three best tight ends in college football. I think Braden Lindsay is a guy that's got big playability. It's about just finding ways to get him going. Lorenzo Styles, I mean, you know, we're we're both thinking he's going to have a, a a really, he's going to be a really good player. We've seen Avery Davis capable of making those big plays, right, and including in some big games. And you know, we, we think Chris Tyree obviously can be that guy. I mean, I just and then of course, if Tyler Buckner wins a starting quarterback job, you're going to have a quarterback that can just rip off a sixty yard run and you beat you over the top with the with the rows. So, I think it's going to be more explosive offense. Whether it's going to be more efficient. Is going to determine whether the points stay the same or whether you're going to see a jump. Defensively, I think the biggest thing is we're going to see a lot more plays out of the linebackers this year. I think that's something that's going to be different. And I think it's – I don't know if I would say that's definitely something that I'm guaranteeing or I'm wishing for, but that's definitely needed. I think the linebacking core has to make more plays. If you look at the tackle for loss and sack numbers at linebacker and pass breakup numbers from like 2020 – and compare it to where they were in 2019 or 2021, I mean, it's a big difference. Like not nearly as productive at linebacker. You got Maris Lewifow back. We had an update on him and our, our defensive intel feature today at Irish Breakdown on, on the premium message board only is where it can be found. And, you know, you th- we think J.D. Bertrand is going to move inside where he's going to be more comfortable. You got Prince Kali emerging. You've got the freshman. I think we're definitely going to see, and now you're going into year two of a defense that's going to be similar to what you ran last year. I think I think there you're gonna see you're gonna see a jump in production there. And I think that's that's a key, right? Because you talk about there's a lot of known commodities. That's the one unknown commodity, in in my opinion, is is gonna be linebacker because you, there's no more Drew White, right? Maris Lufau. We think he can be this, but we don't know yet. We haven't seen him do it over you know a period of time. And so you know, that that to me is is the big question mark. And if the if the linebacking core can make that jump and all those other things that Ryan said are true, then I think that's where you start to say, hey, this this group's got a chance to be 
this group's, group's got a chance to be really good. Let's get to some more questions. Uh, Irish Marine also asks, will Coach Freeman play two quarterbacks this year? I think it depends on who wins the starting job. Uh, if Drew Pine wins the starting job, then you're going to see two quarterbacks because you're going to see exactly what you saw last year. You're going to see the starter do one thing, and then you're going to see the guy come in off the bench. You know, Tyler Buck to be the guy that comes off the bench and provides the running and the big plays and those type of things. If Tyler Buckner's the starting quarterback, I don't think you're going to see a second quarterback. And the reason I say that is the reason that you bring Tyler Buckner in off the bench as the number two quarterback is because he brings a completely different element that you don't have with the other quarterbacks. And that is his running ability. So there's just, there, there's an, there's an, there's a, a talent there that you can, you can tap into that you don't. If Tyler Buckner's a starting quarterback, there's really nothing that that Drew Pine or Steve Angeli do that are going to cause you to say, here's why you got to play a second quarterback. So that's my thing, Ryan. So my, my answer to this question, Ryan, was mm-hmm. is it depends on who starts. If Drew Pine starts, we'll see two quarterbacks. If right. Tyler Buckner starts, the only time we'll see a second quarterback is either end of game mop ups or if somebody goes down, it would be my prediction. Yeah, I mean, I think the scenario that everybody's kind of expecting is that Tyler Buckner started quarterback. If that's the, the case, I don't think that you'll see much of Drew Pine. So I, I do believe that that is, I mean, obviously outside of an injury or inconsistent play, but like, you know, being an optimist, let's hope that Tyler Buckner takes the job and doesn't get unseated at any point. The other way is, like you said, if Drew Pine's a starting quarterback, wins the starting job, Notre Dame has to utilize the talent mm-hmm. of Tyler Buckner. Like you're not going to leave him on the bench. Like that doesn't make any sense. He's one of your best athletes on the, on the team in general. Right. So I agree if, if they're, they're one scenario where there could potentially be some quarterback, you know, shared reps, but I do believe that in the ideal situation, Tyler Buckner takes the starting job and he doesn't get unseated because I don't think that Drew Pine brings a dynamic element as an athlete, obviously, that you're going to take him out of the game. Like you, you're you sacrificing athleticism in that, in that perspective. Mm-hmm. And then along those lines, Irish Marine also asks, who do you think will win the – who will, who will win the, card, the, the quarterback starting job? What are your thoughts? I think we're Tyler both on Buckner. the same page there, Ryan. Yeah, I think we <laughs> yes. both think it'll be Tyler Buckner. I'm not I'm not betting against Drew Pine at anything. It's just there's, sure. a, there's a talent gap there. I mean, there just is. Mm-hmm. But um, – I, Drew, Drew Pine strikes me as the kind of kid that just takes a lot of joy in making people look stupid, right? Like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm sure, Tyler Buckner got it. Okay, wait till you see what I got for you. I mean, just the kind of kid he is. But I mean, look, I, I'm sorry, I love, I love Tyler. Great family. Mm-hmm. He's just not as talented as uh, he's just Drew. I'm talking about. I just, he's just Drew's got a great family. Drew's a great kid. I don't know Tyler Buckner's family. Uh, I don't really know Tyler, but but I, I know Drew and his family, and they're awesome people. And mm-hmm. Drew has a, is is I think is the kind of kid that could ha- make a career out of just make, make making doubters look stupid. Sure. But at the end of the day, I, I have to look at the talent level, and Tyler Buckner's incredibly gifted in ways that Drew Pine just isn't. And I don't think that can be discounted. And and it's why I think he's going to win the job and 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 be really good. And if he gets hurt, I have full confidence Drew Pine is going to be able to come off the t- bench and rally the team and win you a lot of football games. But if yeah. they're both healthy, I just I have a hard time seeing Tyler Buckner not winning that job. He's not going to be given the job. That's one thing I can say for certain. From talking to different people, like if Tyler Buckner wins the starting job, he's going to earn it. It's not a situation where if he goes out there and plays bad every day, they're going to keep trotting him out there because they hope he wins it. If Drew Pine outplays him, Drew Pine's going to start. It's as simple as that. But I think the expectation is, is that, look, Tyler's just – everybody sees it, right? Players see it. Coaches see it. The quarterbacks see it. Tyler Buckner's got special talent. It's just about can he yeah. play that way. There's a difference between having great talent and being a great player. As you, as Ryan, sure. you know, you've seen it doing draft stuff. You see all the time, you're like, how is this kid not a dominant football player? I know you watch film every year, and you're like, this kid is big, he's strong, he's athletic, he's terrible. You know, Blaine Gabbert. Just... <laughs> there man. you go. Yeah. There you go. Brian, um, I, I, would lo- I would love to put a little more context in this one by actually pulling up a yeah. different question. Quinn Kibler mm-hmm. said, do you think that people are dismissing what kind of player Buckner can be, not so much because of his performance or because there is a new shiny toy out there in Dante Moore? I think both have merit. I was actually going to bring this up, Quinn, so I appreciate you popping this in, right? Everybody is so excited about the potential of Notre Dame landing Dante Moore, who is five-star, incredible player, 
we think that he could be the next, you know, we think that he can kind of change the narrative around the quarterback position in Notre Dame and change mm-hmm. a lot of narratives just in general about the program. But I believe that Tyler Buckner is that same type of player if he hits his ceiling. I really do. I think that he could be a program changer and a difference maker. So, yes, I think that people are discounting how talented Tyler Buckner is a little bit because they just want the next, you know, the next shiny toy. So right. I agree with that. I agree with that that comments, and I just wanted to pop that up because I really do think that people are underselling just how talented Tyler Buckner is. So I, I wrote an article not long ago where I talked about it's going to be Buckner and Dante Moore and Tommy Reese to combine to to change the narrative of quarterback play. Because to to your point, yes, I'm excited about Dante Moore, and I think Dante Moore is a phenomenal quarterback. But to your point. Tyler Buckner's the quarterback the next two years, at least. You know what I mean? And and they need him to step up and play. I, I think the dismissal – I think people dismissing Tyler Buckner has more to do with what he – how he was used this year and, and people setting unrealistic expectations for what he was going to do and people assuming that, well, he was used this way, so clearly that's the only thing that – that's the only thing he can do well. And I think that's incredibly misguided. I mean, I have people tell me this. Tyler Buckner did what he did last year because he was too good not to play. And that's that that's how that's how you need to view last season. Tyler only got on the field for one reason, one reason only. He was too good not to play. He's too dynamic to your point. If if Drew won the job, he was too dynamic of a player to not find a role for. That's a good sign. And and they had to they had to get that going. I, I think the fact that you know he didn't look like this or that. I think people people got too excited about a spring performance, and we tried to we tried to tamp down those expectations. And then I think people assume that because he did this in the in in the time he played that that's who he is. And, and I don't think that's right. I, I think so. I think that also factors. And now, because like to your, to the point, Ryan is even if Dante Moore wasn't leaning towards Notre Dame, or we didn't think Notre Dame was going to get Dante Moore, I still think a lot of those same people would be would be down on Tyler Buckner. I just think they'd be down in general. They'd just be down like Tyler Buckner's not the guy, and I don't know who that guy is. Now those people are just like, Tyler Buckner's not the guy, but Dante Moore will be. And I think I think that's misguided because I think both of them have a chance to be great players, just like Deshaun Watson and and, and uh, Trevor Lawrence, just like, you know, Tua and Mac Jones, and then Bryce Young, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's where you want to be as a program. And so uh, I, I do think, I think a lot of people are discounting Tyler Buckner and I think that's going to look like not a good idea. Like it's, it's going to, it's, and it's not going to take like all year. I think you're going to know by the end of September, like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have written that kid off. He's really good. He's a really good player. We'll we'll see. Well, I mean, that's the thing I love about though, Ryan is we're going to find out, (laughs) you know what I mean? One way or the other, we're going to find out. And well, there's three ways. One, he just gets beat out, and then he's clearly not the guy we thought he was. Two is he starts and but doesn't play well. And then three is we're right, and he starts and he's really good and and uh, gets somewhere he needed to get to. Benjamin Karchi, this is going to be about the offensive line, Ryan. We'll give you a chance to answer this since we talked about it before. What impact or improvement would you like to see at the end of spring ball? And we'll go for in regards to the offensive line. Yeah, no, I, I think just more added reps for young guys, right? Like there's just going to be – I think there's going to be improvements over the across the board just in general. I would usually say the biggest thing for spring is, is trying to find who that starting five is, right? I mean, not as much because you're going to go into the fall and you're going to start the competition back over again to a degree. But it's nice to just cr- start to get offensive lines in sync because it's so dependent on, upon, upon one another. Like it really is like a, mach- a well-oiled machine, right? But unfortunately, Jared Patterson is not going to be there in the spring. So your starting center is not going to be a part of the equation in the spring. So I want to see the young players and I want to see where they met, where they fit in. I know you were talking about Michael Carmody. Is he a tackle? Is he going to fit inside a guard? Mm -hmm. Is he corral? Is he going to get some reps at at guard? Are you going to focus with them exclusively at center? Who's going to be the guy that's going to get some center reps additionally outside of like maybe like a Pat Coogan? Uh, since Jared Patterson's not available. So I think there's a lot of young guys that we're going to see really take a massive step, even the sophomores that, again, we're excited about offensive tackle, seeing that that maturation of them just individually as players. And then when we get into fall ball, I want to see them now, like, let's start to really mesh as that unit because the just the timing and the cohesion of that of the five up front is just so important. But unfortunately, without, without Patterson, it's not going to be a perfect situation, but I think it is going to offer a lot of opportunity. In this uh, mm-hmm. spring 
Chris Ayers says, so might Lug be the better swing guy if he isn't the clear winner? Same take on Spindler. I think if if Josh Lug is still the better player, you don't you don't like you don't take him out of the starting lineup so he can be a swing guy. If he's one of your best five, you start him. To your point, however, if he's not the starter, he brings great value as a swing guy. So I don't think he's better as a swing guy per se. I think if he's one of the five best, you start him. I think what a guy like Josh Lugs gives you the ability to do is he can move around and say, hey, look, you know, let's just say one of the young tackles is really struggling and he's just not figuring it out. You can always bump Josh back out there and move that guy to guard. And, or if somebody gets hurt, you know, if, if a tackle gets hurt and you don't have a lot of – there's a big gap between your third tackle and your, your next guard, then you can maybe say, look, let's put one of the guards in and we can bump Josh out to right tackle or something like that. I mean, there's always things that you can do with a guy like him, but if he's one of your best five, you're going to start him. And I don't really view Rocco as a swing guy. I think Rocco is an interior player. So you could be a swing guy from the standpoint of right or left guard or maybe even center. But right now, all we know that Rocco can play is guard. We don't know that he can play center and, and he's not a tackle. So I don't view him as a, as a swing guy. Yeah. Well, Robert, I think in that, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say in that situation, you are saying though, that, you know, if he's not the clear winner, I, I would always defer to the younger player, right? Cause there's just a little more upside. And I think that Josh does give you that swing ability potentially because he has played tackle. He has played at guard. And I, I think that that does kind of improve depth at a couple different spots, but. So are you I mean, saying that if he's not the clear winner, so like he's better, but not by much, you're saying you go with the younger uh, no, player. I'm, I'm thinking of, if they are on the same level, I'm deferring to the younger yeah. player. If he's a, if he's a slight winner, then he wins. Right. But right. I, it, it, with how it's worded, I'm assuming that they're just like neck and neck. They're the same type right. of guy. You know All I mean? things being equal. I, I would I would say, yeah, I would go with you because there's two things. Number one, it's not just the younger guy, but all things being equal, I'm not putting the guy in there that's got injury problems, injury history for, for me. Uh, the other argument is if all things are being equal, go with the experience because you're trying to win now. So there's all types of different ways. Where do you view your football team? Do you view your football team as one capable of competing for a championship? If you do, then you play the guy that gives you a best chance to win today. And then what tends to happen is, what I would do in that case, I would say, okay, Josh is going to start because he's got the experience. I'm not sending a, a brand new kid that we don't know what he can do into Columbus. What I will do, however, say, look, jo if, if all things are equal, I'm starting Josh, but this kid's going to play. And then eventually you give that kid a chance to say, okay, I'm the better player, and you start him. If you think you're a team that's capable of winning a championship now. If you're a team that says, hey, I think we can be really good, but 2023 is our year, then I, you go with the younger guy. So I just think there's so many factors that go into it. But to your point, and if all things are equal, do you value experience more than youth? Do you do you value uh, potential versus experience? Right? Mm -hmm. Do you value do you do you take into account injury history or not? That's one of the challenges of being a football coach is you have to determine which factors for this particular football team are going to matter most. Some years it's going to be a different answer. And I think that's going to be the interesting thing. And then the other thing too is how close, if it's just about the younger player is the better player, but he just doesn't have the experience, then I think you have to kind of err on the side of the the, the more talented player if he's shown you enough that he can get that guy. So it, it it's it's one of the the fun things about being a coach, Ryan, is those type of those type of battles and those type of decisions. I know you've been there too, you know, coaching coaching in high school. It's 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 kind of what makes it fun, but. Uh, I, I think it just depends on how how good they think this team can be. And I think the answer may be different going into Columbus than it could be coming home the next week playing against Cal, especially depending <laughs> on how the veteran guy does. You know what I mean? But honestly, if it was that close, I think you got to play both of them. I, 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 that that would be my thing. I think you got to play both of them if it's that close. If they're neck and neck, play both of them. Robert Didoff says, Brian and Ryan, sorry if this has been mentioned before, but will there be an IB tailgate for the spring game? My buddy Chris and I bought our sideline tickets today. Go Irish. Yes, there will be. Now the game's going to be at one o'clock. Uh, so we won't be tailgating for super long, but yes, I'll be there. Vince won't be there. Ryan, I don't think you guys have plans to come in town for the spring game. Correct. Uh, so it's a little, little harder for Ryan to travel because he's got a, he's got a one-year-old at home. So uh, I don't think anyone wants to, you know, jump on a plane with a one-year-old. At least I wouldn't want to, Absolutely but not. Uh, I'll be there. Sean will be there. And uh, Sean will be covering the game in the press box. I'll be on the field because um, I can pay for a ticket and sit right behind the players, but I, for safety reasons, I can't be way up in the press box. So it makes total sense. Uh, so I, I, I bought a ticket today. I'll be there with my wife. We'll be relaxing, having fun, and letting you guys do all the work. 
So I don't <laughs> Brian's like, yeah, that's nothing new. All right, Michael Rudiker, uh, what percentage do you want the line to be as far as finished product by the end of the spring? I mean, you always want it to be at 100, right? It's just not realistic. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I say a number like is it, I don't really, I, Michael, I don't really look at it like that. I just like, I want to end the spring better than where we were when we started. I think that's really healthy and where we were when we started. That would be my goal as a coach, better than where we were when we started. That's fair. I, I'd say 80% because we'll, we should find out who four of the five stars are because Jared mm-hmm. Patterson will be, will be participating. So I say 80% just for you, Michael. Here's one for you, uh, Ryan. This is for you. What is your pro comp for Blake Fisher and Joe Alt? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good one. Um, Joe Alt strikes me as like a Ryan Ramchek that came out of Wisconsin. You remember him? He's actually a really good offensive mm-hmm. tackle now for the New Orleans Saints. And, I mean, he's got the, the length and he's got the size to him. But I just think that the what really stands out about Ryan Ramchek is that I think he's just so consistently technical, right? And I think that that's going to be Joe Alt's upside too. Even though I think Joe Alt might be a, just a better athlete than Ramchek in general, but I think that, that he just kind of strikes me as he's going to last an offensive tackle because he's just a technically sound kid with length and he's a plus athlete, right? And I think that that's kind of looks at that. Blake Fisher's an interesting one because his body type is a little – I don't want to say odd, but it's different for offensive tackles, right? Like usually they're a little more high cut, a little more slender. I mean, Blake is just a massive dude, right? And it's good weight. So it's not, but he's just like a physically daunting player. So I'm thinking like, I mean, I'm going to go a little more old school in this one. I'm going to say like Eric Williams that used to play with the Dallas Cowboys, right? He used to beat people up. He probably could have, he definitely could have played guard if he wanted to as well. Like he was a road grading presence and he was a thick dude that could have played guard, could have played tackle. So I'll go the physical dominating nature of Eric Williams. Of course, I'm not predicting that Blake Fisher is going to be Eric Williams because he was a great player. I'm not predicting that Joel is going to be a first round draft pick and one of the best offensive tackles in the NFL, Ryan Ramchek. But stylistically speaking, I think there's some merit to the comparisons. Here's a good one for you, Ryan. From Paul, do you prefer Jeremiah Love or Jaden Lamar? Long term, I would say Love, just because I think the upside is higher because he's just such an athletic kid. I mean, he's six mm-hmm. one, one ninety five, and I think he's going to be an easy two ten, two fifteen, maybe even two twenty. Like he's got that type of frame to him, and I just think that the upside of the, as far as like I think they're both fast, but. Love is a 10, 700 meter guy as a sophomore. So like he can run, mm-hmm. man, like he can really fly. Jaden Lamar just went to the, the, um, I forget what the combines call that he went to, but he ran four, five, three lasered. So like he's, he's got, and that was supposedly too. the fastest time of anybody there. Yeah. So, it was that's, just, so he, that's moving pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to him yesterday and it's going to be in the update. So that was the fastest time this year. And it was the second fastest time that they recorded at the event behind Malik Brown, who came out of modern day last year and is going to right. USC. They're running back. Yeah, he can so, move. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they b- both move. I think that Lamar gives you a better baseline because I just think he's a little more, I think he's a little more prepared because I just think he's played mm-hmm. a little bit more. More natural him. running back. Yeah. yeah he's more a more natural, natural running, running back. back. Exactly. The, for, the, the 40 times surprised me because I that doesn't show on film to me. Like that kind of speed doesn't show on film to me. And that's what one of the reasons I say part of the reason I'm not super high on Lamar is because of that right there. Without seeing that speed, to me, he's not a whole lot different than Cedric Irvin. I think he's a little bit better than Cedric Irvin, but not by much. I'm not taking two guys that are that similar as players and style and all that type of stuff. That's my issue. But if he's a legit that fast, then that changes things a little bit. But I got to see it show up on film, right? Because track speed doesn't always translate to football speed. And that, that's kind of my thing. Whereas Jeremiah Love, not only – we know he's explosive, not just from his track times, but on the field. You see it on the field. He's also a better complement to me than Cedric Irvin. And that's important for me when that's you fair. look at running back. Is I like compliments. It's not just about is Jay Lamar a better running back than Jeremiah Love. Yeah, I think he is. Is but is he but is that the right fit for what you're – for putting your quarter – your running back depth chart together? That's a different question. And so who do I prefer if I'm doing a, a top – 250 ranking probably gonna have Jay Lamar ranked higher if I'm talking about putting my recruiting class together I would right now right now lean towards Jeremiah Love unless unless Jay Lamar can go out and show me on film on film that he can play to that level of explosiveness that he showed at the camp because I don't really care about what your track time is I care about does that track time translate to the football field sure. and that's like that's what makes Chris Tyree special is yes he's an elite track guy but he also shows that on the field and that's what you ultimately that's what you look for. 
Chris Ayer says, would you say that Dante Moore to LSU has no chance, especially with that room currently and the future? I don't think the room currently has a lot of impact because I think Jaden Daniels is most likely leaving after this year. He's already played three years. I think mm-hmm. he's going to LSU to play one year and bounce. That's the plan. Doesn't mean it'll happen. And if Miles Brennan's not starting this year, he's not going to stick around, I would imagine, for the next year. So, uh, But th- none of that has anything to do with why Dante Moore's not going to LSU. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, we, we can, we can uh, pick apart the depth chart, but I, I can firmly say that Dante Moore will not be playing football for LSU. Yeah, <laughs> firmly yeah. not happening. Not happening. All right. Let's kind of work through some of these other ones. These are some good questions in here. Uh, Terry Washman, real quick, does blue does Notre Dame have wheelchair seating for the Blue Gold game? I believe they always have wheelchair seating. So I, I do believe that they have that. I, I, I'd have to go kind of look. I, I've seen those sections. I believe that's true. But I honestly can't say for sure uh, that they have good wheelchair seating. I, I would say open it up to kind of other people in the chat. If you've been to a game or if you've ever had somebody be in a wheelchair, uh, if you could answer that question for Terry, I'd really appreciate it. Because I am I believe I've seen wheelchair seating, but I can't tell you with 100% certainty that that is the case. I would imagine that they kind of don't, – don't you have to? Is don't, don't you have to have wheelchair seating? I would imagine there's got to be some kind of law. Yeah, there has to be a law. You have to be obligated to. Right. right? I think so. Yeah. Now, I, I will say this, Terry. There are ramps to get to the upper level. So it's not like there's elevators and ramps. So it's not like you have to go upstairs or an escalator. There are, there are like, you know, incline ramps that you can kind of go up. So at least getting up there is not a problem. And I just don't know if I, – I can't say for certain that there is. Um, or Irish Marine 51 says, how do you rate the offensive backfield? We'll stick with the 1 to 10 scale. What is it yeah. now and what do you think it can be? you know, when it reaches, reaches its peak. I I would say that I would give it a six to start because there is a lot of talent. It is unproven for the most part. Like we've seen spurts of Chris Tyree. We've seen spurts of Logan Diggs. We even saw flashes of Audrick Estime in the one game that he played last year. So I do think that the, that it is a solid baseline because I think that they all fit together very well. Cause I also think Mm -hmm. that, Chris Tyree is that dynamic speed type of back. You can do a little bit of everything with him working in space. Logan Diggs is a little more of a traditional player. And then Audrick Estime is a big physical back that also has better feet than people give him give him credit for as well. So I think they fit together really well. I think the baseline is great. And I think that long-term, eight, like it's not positive. I mean, yeah. I think they could be one of the better yeah. offensive backfields in college football if they utilize yeah. them correctly. Yeah. Eight to me means you're a top 10 group. That's how I, that's just my, in my head, that's how I view it. So as we talk about the offensive line, eight to me is it's top 10. Nine is more top five. 10 is you're just, I mean, you're, you know, you, you, nine is top five, maybe even the best of that particular year. Uh, I think eight is that's six and eight, six, eight right now based. Cause again, at some point in time, you have to look and say, Hey guys, I love the talent, but they got to show it to me now. I mean, that's, we, we've got, if, if we aren't telling you those things and we're just, we're just fanboys out here doing a show. Right. And that's not us. Like we have, we're, look, it can be super talented. Everything Ryan said is true, but they got to, now they got to go show it. Right. And then I would also throw out there and say, um, I would also go out there and, and say that Jadarian Price is part of that conversation too. He's really, really good football player. Um, so uh, excited about him, but yeah, six is where they are now. I think they'll be eight by the time we get to the season and they start being able to go out and prove it, which, which is Ryan. And I, did you shake your head? Yes. When I said eight, is that is a grade of basically a top 10 caliber, like yeah. a top 10 backfield. And that's where I expect mm-hmm. them to be. I also think having a guy like Tyler Buckner is going to help them this year as well. Cause I mean, we Absolutely. saw it last year, I think I was talking to somebody the other day, it's something like they said, like they're, their average yards per carry on inside zone when Tyler Buckner was the game was something like eight yards a carry. That's insane. It was like six when Quentin yeah. in 2017. Like that, that's insane. And that's a phenomenal number. And you're going to see big plays like that with those guys. And then we're going to have the plays like we saw against Toledo where Buckner's kind of running around. Defense gets sucked up and he flicks it over top to Chris Tyree and he runs 55 yards for a touchdown. We're going to see that kind of stuff too more with a guy like, Tyler Buckner quarterback. So that adds to it as well. And if you're going to throw the whole back offensive backfield in it, which, you know, you could take that as like also the quarterback. I think that adds to my feeling. It's going to be an eight because of you add that dimension of Tyler Buckner as part of that backfield as well. Speaking of quarterbacks, Quinn Kibler asks, is Avery Davis or Ron Pulse III more likely to take a snap in 2022 at quarterback? I would say I'm hoping Avery Davis because I still want to see my Avery Davis package. I want to see at least one snap of the Avery Davis package. Okay, Coach Reese, you got to give it to me, man. One snap, right? No, one series. You got to give me one series with Avery Davis and as a Wildcat quarterback. I need to see. I don't care if you do it against Marshall. 
right? You just got to give the defense something to think about, and you got to make me happy and give me that Chris Tyree. So what, what what's your answer to that question, Ryan? <laughs> I, I I don't I don't like being this person, but I probably do a push here. I, I don't I'm not very confident that either is going to touch the football as a quarterback this year. So unfortunately, I'm not being a true optimistic, I guess here. But yeah, yeah I, I'd say I want to I want to see the Wildcat package because I count that as quarterback. Wildcat package counts as quarterback for me. Okay, now if the question is, is he going to line up and he is the quarterback? <laughs> because some bad stuff went down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, no. That's not going to happen. Emergency quarterback. Yeah. yeah. Benji, do you see Chris Tyree staying for three more years or just two more years? I think if the O-line is as good as I think it will be, he's gone. He's going to have a breakout year this year. I think Chris Tyree will stay for his four years of eligibility. Barring him just having a monster season this year. Because the thing you got to understand about Chris Tyree and his family, that is a very academic-oriented family. And if Chris Tyree has a monster year this year, there's going to be the NFL conversation. And then there's going to be the graduation conversation. And that's going to be that's going to carry a lot of weight in the Tyree household. If you're not guaranteed to be a high pick, because the thing is, he doesn't have a ton of wear and tear on his body. Like the thing about Kyron Williams, Ty, Kyron Williams had two back-to-back years of a lot of touches. Right? Chris Tyree has zero years with a lot of touches. Right. And so I think that factors in as well. But I mean, he's got a younger brother who's a 2020. He's, I think he's got two 2024 brothers. I don't know if they're like twins or what but like i've seen more tweets from his dad about their gpas than their talent and they're they're good young players that's just the kind of family that the tyrees are like that's part of the reason he's at notre dame is they are very much a yes football is important but football is going to be gone someday and what are you going to have with it so i think that would be a different conversation than you're going to see from most backs that were like top 100 players coming to high school chris is a different cat in that regards uh, and if you ever talk to him, you're like, oh, yeah, this kid's different. This kid's smart. This kid's like – he's just not like your typical skill player. Uh, and and that's why I think that conversation might be a little bit – a little bit uh, a little bit different in that regards. Yeah. Irish Mean 51, will Coach Freeman use a run-and-gun offense? Will he be more of an up-tempo coach when you are uh, on top of a team? Do you put your foot on your throat and finish them or play conservative? Uh, number one, I have no clue. We haven't seen him really do that. Uh, I think from the bowl game, I think we're going to see him say, Tommy, go do what you do. I think Mm -hmm. what Coach Freeman wants is an offense that's efficient and scores and is explosive. I think he he understands as a defensive coordinator, especially he's going to have to understand as a defensive coordinator because the mistake you see from offensive coordinators, that the defensive coordinators that fail as head coaches are guys that think that you need to go out and win a bunch of 17 to 14 games. Right. That's one of the reasons I think Vic Fangio failed in Denver. No, like the the guys that have won. I mean, if you think about Pete Carroll's a defensive guy, but why'd they win at USC? They had great offenses. Right. Uh, Bill Belichick had great offenses during his time. Now they had very good defenses too. It doesn't mean that you sacrifice defense to be great on offense, but it's, it's a, it's a, you understand like you got to score, right? You've got to go out and score. And so he understands that. Now, does that mean he wants to turn it over 18 times in order to score? No, but I think they're going to be a, they're going to be a very pro style team that is going to be efficient and explosive is the goal. I don't think he cares about run and gun or air raid or spread or pro style. I don't think he really has necessarily a belief on what that needs to be. I think he cares more about the end result is what I think he cares more about. Uh, that would be my answer. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, the first thing that caught my attention was, will Coach Freeman use a runner gun? I don't think Coach Freeman's going to use anything, right? Like, I think that mm-hmm. unlocking Tommy to see what he has up his sleeve, right? Like, you saw it a little bit in the bowl game and things I thought opened up a little bit, at least from a passing game perspective. So I think this is a the year that Tommy Reese shows exactly what his offensive identity is, and I think that Coach Freeman is not going to micromanage that. I think he's going to mm-hmm. embrace that and let him open it up. Mm-hmm. Last four, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, 99 problems of BK ain't one, my man. Thoughts on this comp for Tyler Buckner, Dak Prescott of Mississippi State. Dak surprised a lot of people who thought he was a run-pass college QB type of prospect with limited passing potential. I don't know if I necessarily thought that of Dak coming out of high school, out of college. I, I kind of like Dak, and and put, he put up pretty good numbers. So um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I don't like that comp because I think they're completely different type of athletes. Dak is a big, strong guy that ran power. When he ran, he was like a like he was a power guy. Tyler's more quick, power. agile, yeah. 
speed. Yeah. I, I don't I don't see the comp. I think where you could have a comp maybe is their impact, their run throw mm-hmm. impact maybe. Uh, yeah. But I love Dak as a college. I mean, forget the NFL. I, I'm not an NFL guy. I thought Dak was a really good college quarterback. And if Tyler Buckner has the impact that Dak Prescott had, because here's the thing about Tyler, he's going to have way better players around him than Dak Prescott had at Mississippi State. On at every, I mean, they had their players here and there, but as a whole, the team is going to be a lot better. But Dak was, I mean, he had Mississippi State ranked number one at one point in time <laughs> during his <laughs> tenure. Man. Like, he was that's legit. Like, he that's, was when legit. Dan, that's when Dan Mullen was the man, right? That's uh, Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I, I, I I like the comparison from the run pass as well. I also think that they both have like pretty thick frames. I think Dak's a little mm-hmm. bit taller, but like I get the comp. I see where it's coming. And then, I mean, Dak was a nice athlete. I agree that he's much mm-hmm. more power oriented than he is like quick twitch. Like you're not going to run like quarterback off tackle, okay, but you'll do that with Tyler Buckner because he can right. get to the edge and he can make it pay. So um, so I see it to a degree, but I, I don't think that it's perfect. But it, I will say this, 99 Problems, but BK1, I think it is better than some of the cops we've gotten about Tyler. Yes. So yes. kudos to you, sir. Yes. yes. Connor O'Doherty, with an improved offensive line, could Chris Tyree become a top 10 back in the nation this year if he gets enough touches? Sure. Yeah. Why not? I mean, I, I don't well, know. Top, top 10. Top 10 in terms of what, though? I guess that's right. my question. Like, top 10 as far as, like, guys that you do not want to face? Yes. Right. That, opinion. yeah, impact, danger, fear, yes. Production-wise, I don't think so because I don't I don't think he's going to get enough touches. And, and I don't think Chris Tyree getting that number of touches is necessarily the best thing for his game. I think he's going to be a guy that just isn't is is if the line is what we think it's going to be, and if they use him the way that they need to use him, I think he's that kind of guy that you're like, guys, you have to have a Chris Tyree plan. You have to, and that's what I. That's why that like Ryan to me. That's part of the reason I'm so optimistic optimistic about this team. Is who do you stop? If but because it all comes down to the line. Like last year, you didn't have that problem because you could stop Kyron by stopping the line, like just. That was the reality, right? You could take Kyron out of the game by just beating up the line. I mean, that, that that's we saw that so many times last year. I don't think you can do that as much with Chris Tyree because he's such more a, such a more explosive player. If the line improves, and we saw that in the bowl game, they completely took him out of the run game, but he showed he can still be a home run guy in the pass game. And Kyron brought obviously pass game ability as well. But like, if the line's better, I mean, Chris Tyree's a, a home run every time he touches the ball. Potential every time he touches. You have to you have to plan for that. But then you've got Michael Mayer, and then you've got you know if they use Braden Lindsey correctly. You no, know, think about this: you 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 have a play, and you got Tyler Buckner quarterback with his ability. You got Chris Tyree at running back. You got Michael Mayer flexed out to the right with Deion Colsey to the left and Braden Lindsey over there, right? Or you know, I mean, and and then you've got so that's the tight end running back. You and then you've got Avery Davis or or Lorenzo Styles outside in the trips look. You bring Braden Lindsay on a jet motion, and you've got him going on a jet, which is dangerous. You've got read zone action where you've got to determine between Tyler Buckner and Chris Tyree, and you got to deal with all that. Oh, and by the way, they're running an RPO, so if you fly down, he's going to pull the ball and throw it outside to Lorenzo Styles or Michael Mayer, right? Like, you, you, like, how do you defend? How do you take all those guys out of the game if they are the players we think they can be, right? And and I didn't even mention Avery Davis. I didn't mention being in 20 personnel with Logan Diggs. I, I accidentally said Deion Colsey, but I meant to say Lorenzo Styles. I mean, that's why I'm excited about this team is if the line plays to its potential, it's kind of like who do you who do you take out? You're gonna take you're gonna folk you're gonna take out Michael Mayer until Chris Tyree was like, that was dumb. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. and then you focus on him and then Bray, and Lorenzo Styles is like, oh, you forgot about me. You know, and that's what makes that's what made that 2015 team kind of dangerous. And and this unit even more has like this team doesn't have a Will Fuller. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. But the the option like Chris Brown and Amir Carlisle were good players. Like mm-hmm. the tight end wasn't. I mean, Alize Jones as a freshman was not close to what Michael Mayer will be as a junior. Absolutely. That running backs are every bit as explosive as that 15 group was because of Chris Tyree. But the depth of impact players receiver is greater than it was in 2015, in my opinion. You had Will Fuller, Chris Brown, Amir Carlisle. Now you've got Lorenzo Styles, you've got Braden Lindsay, you've got Avery Davis, you've got Deion Colsey. You've, I mean, it just and you got Michael Mayer. It just 
that's what's exciting about this team, Ryan, is there's a lot of weapons, and it's just going to be like a who who all do you take out of the game? And how many of them can you actually take out of the game? But it all boils down to that first one. It's a lot easier to take athletes out of the game when you're beating up the offensive line. And sure. I don't think that's going to happen this year uh, like it did. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Ryan? No, I, 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 I mean, I, I was kind of alluding to it, right? Like, I think that when you say top 10 back, I mean, fundamentally speaking, maybe not, but like top 10 weapon, I can get there mm-hmm. with that because mm-hmm. I think, again, you, you, I mean, you said it. Chris Tyree is a threat to take it to the house every single time he touches the football, just based upon his speed with an improved offensive line play. And then, like you said, like you can't just gravitate all the attention towards Michael Mayer all the time. Like that's going to be your first Mm -hmm. priority is to stop him, obviously, for what he's coming back. But then you're going to leave guys like Lorenzo Styles and Deion Colsey and Braden Lindsay and all these guys in one-on-one situations. And eventually they're going to take advantage of it, ideally. Right. So mm-hmm. then I think that I think that you're just not going to put enough attention on a guy like a Chris Tyree. And if the offensive line's improved, I think he could break off a lot of big yeah. runs. And I think that he can be that top 10 weapon in the country because right. that's you can't you can't quantify how important that speed is, man. Like right. this guy is like one of those dudes where if you're if you're a defense and you're just one gap short, your gap integrity is not great on one play. You're giving up an 80 yard touchdown. Like that is just the Mm -hmm. facts of it. So that's just what makes it such a difficult player to stop if everything's rolling right. Last two, Terry Howe, is it possible that two freshmen start on the offensive line? Terry, is it possible? Sure, it's possible, but it would have to require some stuff to go wrong. It's not going to be two guys just win jobs, in my opinion. Uh, It would have to be. And if that happens, it's because some dudes just like, I mean, three of the guys we expect start just did nothing but sit in their dorms and drink beers all spring and summer. I mean, that that's, that's just because there's such an age difference and, and the talent is good in the freshman class, but it's not to the level where they're just going to come in and pass up Rocco and Christophic and Lug and all those guys day one. I just don't see it. There'd have to be injuries. Now, if there's injuries, sure. Cause here's the reality for two freshmen to start. There's only two positions that are going to be basically open, right? right? The tackles are locked down. The center's locked down and barring injury. So there's so they'd have to win both win both of the guard jobs. So the only way I see two freshmen starting, it'd be both guards, and it would mean there'd have to be to me a, a, a rash of injuries, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, if if there have to be absolutely have to be a rash if we're talking about two true freshmen. Now, if you want to count Rocco Spindler and Blake Fisher as redshirt freshmen into this equation, then sure. Like they, I mean, if Rocco Spindler wins an offensive guard spot. And obviously Blake Fisher is going to play playing somewhere on the offensive line. So in that situation, right. sure. But if we're talking about true freshmen, I, I don't I just don't see that happening. Right. And here, here's the response to me naming all those players. David Duve says, and then Tobias Merriweather says hello. You're absolutely fair. right. Fair. He's fair. absolutely right. I mean, who was my number one ranked offensive player in last year's class? That's what gets exciting about it, right? And you know, it, it's it's a it's a fun problem to have. We actually do have another one I want to get to before the last one. Just quickly, guinea pig clips is how fast are Diggs estimating price? Tyree's a home run hitter, but I don't know if those guys are. Price is, the other two are not. Yes. But you don't have yeah. to be home. Look, Kyron Williams had a 90 plus yard touchdown run this year, right? You don't have to be, a, and he ran a four, what, four, six, five, four, seven four, at the six, combine. Five. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Those guys are plenty fast enough when you have holes to hit big plays. Dexter Williams is a four, five, eight guy, right? And, that's the thing is when you've got uh, when you've got the angle and you've got blocked lines and you've got good downfield blocking, you can rip off home runs. But as far as like a home run hitter, like when I define home, look, any of the running backs can take can hit a home run. Kyron sure. Williams hit a 91 yard home run last year. He's not a home run hitter. Right. Like they can hit home runs as far as when I say home run hitter. So I'm going to take his question to mean who are the guys that every time they touch the ball, they're a threat where you got to worry about this is going to go the distance. I think it's it's Tyree and Price are the two that I think have that ability, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I always quantify it as who are the guys that can break angles, right? Like right. that is my biggest thing. And Chris Tyree sure can break angles. I think right. Jadarian Price can break angles. I think that Estime and Diggs, I mean, like they have both have acceleration and they're both explosive kids, but they're mm-hmm. not guys that I think racing towards the sideline are just going to r- just run by a guy consistently, right? right? So that's where I kind of – that's right. where I kind of quantify home run hitter versus just a guy that has good right. speed or a guy that has they can rip off home runs because your receivers did their job downfield and that safety's not exactly. coming from behind to catch them, right? Exactly. That that's the difference. It's like that's how Tony Jones can rip off an eighty some yard touchdown run against Iowa State. It's how Kyron sure. Williams go ninety one against North Carolina, whereas Josh Josh uh, Dexter 
was even though he wouldn't have a great 40 time. Dexter was an explosive player, even though he didn't have a great 40 time. But Dexter no. and Josh Adams and Chris Tyree and Jadarian Price, to your point, have that speed to where you think you have it, but you don't. And then you don't. And then you don't. And, <laughs> and that's the difference. And and Dexter and Tyree even more so than 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 Josh, because Josh was a guy that was more of a he needed to get going a little bit to get that speed. Josh wasn't a guy that was going to outrun the edge as much. Josh was more of a, he's going to stretch, stretch, stretch. As soon as that hole opens up, he's gone. He's a, he's a flying 20. He's not an instant separation yeah, guy. Like right. that, that we're, second 20 yards yeah. in the 40, like that's where he that's is. That's right. right. Where I, I still don't know if anyone's had anyone that in the last 15 years, Notre Dame, I don't think has had a back with a better first step than Dexter Williams. I mean, he didn't have the long speed, right? He was a he, if he was a four five eight, he was a four five eight out of a stance. Where Josh Josh uh, Adams was a four four eight, but he was a four eight coming out of a stance. The four four eight didn't come until he got downfield. Chris Tyree right. is probably the closest thing we've seen to that, but w- and I'm curious to see kind of how that manifests this year is the thing I'm really curious to see now that he's got some time under his belt. And then the last question, this is a good one to end on. I've been saving this one for the end from Connor O'Doherty. Who do you guys think are the three most talented players on offense and defense? So the way that I want to take this, because we could take this so many angles, we could do a show out of this. Let's talk about talent for 2022, which means you have to take into consideration development, experience, and age, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, if we're talking about three most talented offensive linemen, if we're talking about if they all reach their full potential, we could talk about Emil Wagner, but he ain't going to be that guy in 2022, we don't think, right? So sure. for 2022, who do you think are the three most talented players on offense and who are the mm-hmm. three on defense? Let's start with offense, Ryan. Give me your three most talented players. I have a pretty good idea on who mine are, and it's not okay. easy. It's not easy to to, to t- come up with those. I, I would say Blake Fisher is definitely one. I would say that – Tyler Buckner's two for mm-hmm. me. And I would say Michael Mayer, even though I mm-hmm. think somebody would push back on that one. But I think for when you're talking about him coming into the NFL, this kid could be a generational type of type of two-way tight end. So that would be my three, I think. That's my three, which again speaks volumes about how talented this team could be because there's no Chris Tyree in our top three. There's no Lorenzo Styles in our top three. There's a lot of teams in the country that those two guys are in their top three. <laughs> You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. And no, those three are my three. Uh, and, and Blake, as far as ten, Blake's one, uh, I'd say Mayer's probably two right now and Buckner's three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think because Buckner still is young, that youth is going to somewhat tamp down his ultimate potential, but I think he's going to be dynamic this year. The three on defense, I think, are probably pretty easy as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Your three on defense. I think we're going to have the same on on there. Uh, there's one potential difference on defense that we may have. I'm very curious to see about that, and I and I think I know who it who it might be. But I think we also might still have the same three. So give me your give me your three on defense. I, I think we are going to have a different one here. Um, uh, Isaiah Foskey is one. Uh-huh. Number two would be Cam Hart. Uh huh. So far, so good. This is where I I know who the difference is going to be. Number three, I would go at Maris Loifau. I would. Yep. <laughs> I would, I would, I would. I would. I'm going I think, Jason Adamiola, but that's yeah, fine. that's fair. That's yeah. fair. And I, I think that Jason, I mean, baseline is much higher than Amaris because like you still need to uh-huh. kind of see it. Right? right. But I think if Maris hits his potential, man, and I think that he potentially can in 2022, I think we're talking about a special linebacker, like not just a good linebacker. Cause I think he is long athletic and can run. So that, that would be my guy. I think as my breakout mm-hmm. dude, because I mean, you, I mean, if you're talking long term, then obviously you're bringing in like the Jalen Sneeds and those types sure. of conversations. But for sure. 2022, 2022, I think right. I think Maris, I think Maris could be special this year. I really yeah. do. I think he's got a chance. I think he's got a chance. But I'm still in the I got to see it mode. But I also think that I think Jason Adamiola is really good. I think he's really he is, good. Uh, but sure. he's also a guy that I need to see him. He's the one guy to me on defense that I'm like he was so good last year, but I it doesn't always show up in the production. The thing mm-hmm. for me this year that could separate whether you're correct or I mean that's not correct, but I mean, we have our opinions. But whether your answer looks correct or mine looks correct is going to be he's going to have to start turning that talent into more more production. Because mm-hmm. I do think Maris is going to produce. I think Maris is going to have ten tackles for loss at least. He's going to he's to me going to be a double digit tackle for loss guy. I mean yeah. one of the things in the intel piece I had today, Ryan, that 
I would encourage you guys to sign up for the board because there's a lot of intel on the defense. Not It wasn't quite as juicy as the offensive one, but there's some good stuff in there. But the source mm-hmm. I talked to today said when he got hurt, he was our best pass rusher. Uh, it's like, it wasn't at, he, wasn't, he didn't say best pass rushing linebacker. He said it was our best pass rusher. Mm-hmm. Right? So he could have a big numbers. And if Jason's going to be that top three guy, he's got to start turning that. He's got to kind of have a Sheldon Day type of season as well, in my sure. opinion. And so I, I think he's he's got a chance to prove a whole lot. And somebody said no, Brandon Joseph. Uh, I mean, can I'll, I'll I bring, comment bring, on that? Yeah, so he said I, no, Brandon I, Joseph. Some people are saying he could be a first round pick. Yeah, I mean, so there's no bigger Brandon Joseph fan than I am in here, right? I, if you ask me who is the three best players, I might say Brandon Joseph in that conversation, but you're asking me who has the highest upside, right? Like most, yeah, who's talented. most talent. Right. Right. That's where the conversation starts, uh, tra- changes a little bit because I think Brandon Joseph is a good talent, but I think his, his mental side of his game is what makes him a really good football player. Right. And I think the ball skills are what makes him a really good football player. So I could see those players, Cam Hart, Maris Loyfell, and Isaiah Foskey just being a little more high quality of an athlete at their position. Mm-hmm. But I do think that Brandon Joseph, there's a very fair world where he could be one of your three best play, the sure. defenders in 2022. Sure. Three best, not necessarily three most talented. And that's the difference uh, to the question. Now, it's also the same reason either of us thought about putting Jarrett Patterson in our top three on offense. Sure. He could end up being your best offensive player this year, or at least second best offensive player this year. Mm-hmm. Maybe your second best, you know, your maybe your second highest drafted offensive player that next year doesn't make him as most talented, and that's the difference, right? So that's where we get into it. But the fact that we can say that, and immediately people are like, wait, well, hold on a second, what about this guy? But what about what about that guy? Well, what about this guy over here? I think it's like, yeah, it's good. That's a good. Deb- that's where you want to be. You know, that's yep. where you kind of want to be. I knew you were going to go with Maris too. As soon as I, as soon as I said, I was like, I think we might be on the same page. But if we aren't, I know who your third is going to be. Yeah. Uh, Ryan has been on the Marish train For since years now. I, think, I think it was where you really jumped on. It was actually, if I remember correctly, you were breaking down the Bama Al- film. Al- Alabama game. Yeah. Yep. 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 And yep. just yep. like this dude runs like those dudes run. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like he makes there, some there mistakes, was... but athletically yeah. is like, oh, wow. There, there's there were so many speed deficiencies on that field comparative to Alabama, but Maris was not one of a man. He was moving in that game, and he was I mean he plays hard and he hits. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. there's development. Obviously, the eyes need to get better, the diagnostic skills need to get better, but mm-hmm. like baseline athleticism, there is a lot there. Yeah, that was a fun question. I, I I like ending on questions like that. That was a lot of fun. So that's gonna be it for us today. But hey, as it shows down there. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast. If you're listening via a podcast, give us a five-star review. We'd appreciate that very much. And I'm telling you all, if you aren't signed up for the boards, you're missing out. And hey, listen, as far as I know, they still have con- product left. Uh, Built Bar, for thirty. it's either a 36-hour sale or until supplies last. It started at midnight mountain time last night. They're selling Rocky Road again. So I went ahead when I woke up this morning, literally the first, this is true story. This isn't an advertisement. This is a true story. The first thing I did this morning when I got on my phone is I went and ordered two boxes of the Rocky Road Built Bars. Best protein bars in the business. I'd been saying for a while that I hadn't bought a candy bar since I started Built Bar. When I was in Virginia last week, I was out hanging my nephew. We, he wanted to get candy bars. So I got a candy bar, got a Twix bar, which I love. And I was like, nope, it's not the same. I got to go get me some Built Bars. So you're definitely, definitely, definitely going to want to check that out. So it's going to, but it's a 36 hour sale. So go into tomorrow or until supplies last. Uh, and that is the Built Bar. If you use the Irish Breakdown promo code, you get 10% off your entire purchase. I want to make this clear too. It's not a one time deal. So, like the merch store, we give you that one time deal. If you sign up, you get a 10% or 20% discount, and it's for a one-time purchase. The Built Bar things are for any time you order Built Bars, you get 10% off your entire purchase if you use the Irish Breakdown promo code. You're definitely going to want to check that out as well. So, um, And, of course, sign up for the message board. We had three or four people sign up during the show. I always love it when that happens, but keep signing up. Got tons of good intel. Got offensive intel, defensive intel, recruiting intel. We've had so many the last 48 hours has just been – like seven or eight different recruiting intel updates going on. So we're going to continue those. So if you're not on the message board, y'all, I'm telling you, you're you're definitely missing out. So definitely check that out. And, of course, tonight, 8 p.m., we're going to have a live show at 8 p.m. It's going to be me and Troy Pride, former Notre Dame cornerback Troy Pride. We're going to kind of get an update on what's the latest with him. Obviously, he's coming back from an injury last season. He's got a rehab. 
He's going to talk to us about, you know, his rehab, his comeback. He's going to talk about some things he's got going on in his career sort of off the field. And we're going to talk cornerback play, and we're going to talk about Notre Dame. We'll get into some of his time at Notre Dame and, and kind of his thoughts on how things are going at Notre Dame too. So definitely want to check that out tonight at 8 o'clock. So, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us for the Q&A. Obviously, Vince was here talking O-line play. And thank all of you for joining the Irish Breakdown Podcast.